Welcome to Chicago, where the stunning autumn season brings a breathtaking display of colors. Pops of fall foliage can be found everywhere you go in this picturesque wonderland. Fall brawls are the order of the day at Wintrust Arena, the setting for Bellator MMA's final event of the year. Bellator 301 is deeper than the local saw. Wowza is one word to describe the main card coming up at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Showtime. Undefeated welterweight champion Yaroslav Amosov defends the title against Jason Jackson, who has had his hand raised six straight times to earn his first title shot. Co-main event features Bantamweight boss Sergio Pettis returning to the scene of his signature victory over Bellator go Patricio Pitbull to defend his strap against Patchy Mix. The World Grand Prix winner has gone 5-0 with four finishes since his first crack at 135 gold. Meanwhile, Rafion Stotts looks to rebound from his KO loss to Mix by reigniting his rivalry with Chicago's Danny Sabatello, who hopes to even the score with his arch nemesis. Former featherweight champion AJ McGee sinks his third straight win at 155 when he squares off with number five ranks in the outlaw. And the second lightweight World Grand Prix semifinal pits former champion Patricky Pitbull against the streaking Alexander Shabley, who was 4-0 inside the Bellator MMA cage. Alongside Big John McCarthy, I'm Mauro Ranallo, and the prelims for Bellator 301 begin in the featherweight division. Francis Eve Londu hunts for his fourth win in a row against Japan's Isao Kobayashi, who returns to Bellator competition for the first time in six years, riding a six-fight winning streak. Our talent today for this featherweight matchup is very simple. Take a look at the reach of Yves Landu, 73 inches compared to 68.5 for Kobayashi, but he is a grappler, so he wants to get in close anyways. It is time for the official introductions, courtesy of Chicago's own Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to Bellator 301 tonight from Windrust Arena here in Chicago, Illinois. We get the prelims underway now. The action will begin with three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot seven, weighing in 145.2 pounds. His professional record: 27 wins, five losses, two draws. Fighting out of Tokyo, Japan. Presenting Isa Kobayashi. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight weighing in 145.4 pounds the winner of three straight now inside the bellator cage he brings 19 professional victories nine defeats fighting out of mo france introducing eve london you know and your referee in charge of the action, Mike Simarusti. Featherweights will begin to fly to kick off Bellator 301. Yves Landu from France, Japan's Isao Kobayashi. Global run. flavor run. for Bellator Go. MMA prelims to get things started. And Landu extends a hand. Of sportsmanship before trying to lay hands on Kobayashi and does with a lead right hook from the southpaw stance. That was a clean low kick by Kobayashi coming in. Kobayashi, the king of Pancrase at featherweight, and Pancrase, the proto MMA organization founded by catch wrestlers and of course Minoru Suzuki. Masakatsu was one of the trainers of Frank Shamrock, Boss Rudin, of course Josh Barnett, all former kings of Pancrase. Kobayashi, who's been off the the grid in terms of Bellator, putting together momentum in the land of the rising sun. 
And this fight, very compelling in terms of a stylistic clash, John. Yeah, it's amazing when you take a look at Landu at the age that he is, still super fast. He's an incredible athlete. This guy is one of the break dancers that can just, <laughs> I mean, he's doing spins off his elbows. Popping and locking. He is absolutely amazing to watch, and he's so explosive in the cage. We've seen him with flying knee knockouts, all kinds of different techniques. So Kobayashi needs to be careful on that shoot that he is definitely looking for. And if you know, you know that's Eve Landu's nickname. Shout out to Chief as we uh, warm up here in the opening round scheduled for three at the 145 pound limit. The right hand by Landu and then misses with a sweeping left hook. Landu trained by Cyril Diabate who was, of course, a mixed martial arts pioneer in France, actually fought on Showtime as Kobayashi closes the distance. Unfortunately, his lone appearance in Pride, he was stomped out by Mauricio Shogun Hua. Yeah, that's not the guy you want to face in your first time in Pride or anywhere. But you take a look He's at, done a lot for the French MMA scene, and including for Landou's career. And look at Diabati's fantastic kickboxing career, mm -hmm. very dangerous, and he's really done a great job with Landou, and that he has him in this position where he's confident. Confident in every aspect. And I'm telling you right now, Kobayashi's a great ju judoka. He's got great foot sweeps and everything. Right now, he hasn't been able to hit one of those. And Landu's well, doing a great job of defending. And we were talking, John, before the fight, looking at the, the strategies. And from this position, Kobayashi, known for that body lock takedown, and is good from top position, but he has to secure the body lock. And with Landu pummeling and making it difficult, unable to really do what he intends to be doing right here. And that was because Landu was controlling the wrist of Kobayashi. He wasn't and able to fighting. get that wrist free, and so unable to even think about getting that body lock takedown. There he goes with this beautiful job of looking for that sweep and do just unbelievable balance and a lot of that comes from all of that break dancing everything his body control is outstanding final two minutes of the opening frame Landu putting pressure on Kobayashi, trying to se separate himself from the French fighter. Knee up the middle, another knee by Kobayashi, and Landu changing levels, trying to secure the takedown, but good uh, weight distribution here by Kobayashi with the wizard. That great wizard, exactly. You saw it. That wizard is what kept him able to hold that position. And interesting, you have the wizard and you have the overhook, and of course, wizard is what you use to defend the single leg takedown, break the lock with the overhook, you're going the opposite way. Jump. Absolutely. Got that right? Look at you. Man, 20 years of a MMA broadcasting, I finally learned a thing or two. As uh, Landu is on the canvas with Kobayashi. And this is not putting pressure on him. This is not what you would expect because Landu is the guy that you would think would want to be in the stand up position for more of the fight. And it was Kobayashi that wants to get the ground. And here is Landu taking him down. Gee, mixed martial arts. Amazing. Under a minute left here in the first as Kobayashi looking to get back up to a vertical base as Landu with the waist lock. Matt returned by Landu. Yeah, what you saw Kobayashi do, doing there, just grabbing the fence a little bit, that kills Josh Thompson. He hates that. He wants it banned in the sport. And a double wrist lock being employed by Kobayashi looking for that. And of course, catch wrestling, that's what it is, John. The double wrist lock made famous by those catch wrestlers in Pank Race. And what a history in, in Beautiful. Japan. Beautiful night, beautiful job by Landu to grab that ankle and get behind now. He's got the back, back take by Landu. And the hand fighting by Kobayashi trying to break the grip. 15 seconds left in round number one and a strong start by France's Eve Landu, who comes into this fight with three consecutive victories. So, take to God, you know, and it's a good one, but you didn't change anything. Et on a le même problème que la dernière fois. Eh, hey, va le chercher, Poto. Va le chercher. Fais attention à son crochet bras avant. Fais beaucoup de feint. Fais beaucoup de feint. Par contre, quand tu démarres, il faut que tu sois agressif. Go, dive, bring and dive. Faut que tu arrives à le scorer, car. Assez, n'aille. Tourne, n'aille. 
組とあの打撃の距離ね打撃の距離全然大丈夫だから変な大振りのストレートで突っ込んで右のフックぐらいしか来ないあと変ないきなり変なあの蹴り雑な蹴りしか来ないから絶対大丈夫組もうちょっと冷静に的確に譲らないところだけ OK リラックスねリラックスね呼吸して呼吸してリラックスリラックス OK サケザウサケザウサケザウコバヤシ with that free right hand delivering some elbows to the rib cage but Landu doing a good job of getting back to the cage exactly you picked it up he got his back up against the cage now it's a matter of getting his foot down to the ground his knee down to the ground that's going to help get him up to his feet Kobayashi trying to slide him off of that fence and get him towards the middle of the cage so he can put his back flat on the canvas Were you a uh, King of Pancrase champion, John? Because it's proven to be a pipeline for my broadcast partners. Worked with Boss first, Frank second, <laughs> worked with Josh in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and Kobayashi now looking to go to work on Landu with some ground and pound from distance. He needs to be careful. Oh, up kick from Landu. Uh, but if you notice where Kobayashi's hips were, they were in front of his face. That's keeping him safe from the kicks by Landu. That's nice work. So, strong opening round for Eve Landu, but here in round two, Kobayashi, after taking that nasty combination, culminating with that kick to the head, was able to secure the takedown, and he's been controlling thus far. Absolutely. You take a look, and what he's done is he's whittled away. That was beautiful work by Landu to land that kick. It had some damaging effects, and from that point, getting the takedown, Kobayashi's been in control of his fight, and he's just slowly started to take over. And you on his feet, but Kobayashi looking for the mat return. Takedown. And there is that patented body lock takedown by Kobayashi. Kobayashi cut over the right eye as he moves to, well, trying to pass the guard, going to side control, but Landu. Working from his back, but from this vantage point, it's hard to see the cut. Yeah, but right. The, you're right. There's a yeah, Pollock uh, painting forming, and big shout out to my former Fight Network colleague John Pollock, who's been a huge supporter over the years and is watching tonight from Toronto, Bellator 301. So now that will be cause for concern as Kobayashi continues to put pressure on Landu from top position. Kobayashi really needs to start to open up. He's in a good position right now. That guard's great as far as crushing down on that leg, controlling the hips of Landu. But you don't want to put your chest to chest for long. You've got to do something to damage him. So all of these shots, little tiny things. But remember, he took that big shot at the beginning. That was a big time damaging blow by Landu. And Landu controlling Kobayashi's posture. 
with a minute nine left in the middle frame. And do we'll hope to neutralize Kobayashi so much so that the referee would may order a stand-up. But right now, Kobayashi working, grinding on the inside, cross face, trying to deliver a slashing elbow and does so. Just short strikes, though not a lot of distance there. No, not, not much distance at all. You can see Landu is feeling The referee that. now asking them to keep working. Sorry, John. Yeah, now Landu is feeling it, actually rising up with it keeping it from coming down and slicing into his cheekbone or anything like that. But the one thing that we've seen is on the ground, Kobayashi is able to control the body position and placement of Landu. Kobayashi has had four minutes and counting of ground control here in round two, which is to say a large majority of the five minute frame has seen Kobayashi working from top position. But the most damaging strike delivered by Eve Landu. So how do you do? I do very well, and I would tell you that right now we've got an even fight going into the third round. He's fine. It's from the kick. You should be all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're good. Let's take a look. Here comes that punch kick. Ooh. And that is definitely what cut Kobayashi right there. It was a nice right hand left kick by Landu, but he allowed Kobayashi to get that takedown. And from that point, Kobayashi was able to maintain position. He did ground and pound. Nothing that was incredibly damaging, but enough to make up. When you look at it, what part of the round was striking, what part was grappling, it was majority of grappling, that was definitely won by Kobayashi. Yeah, Kobayashi was outlanded, total strikes by Landu at 17-11, but you talk about the, the nature of the strikes and the amount of ground control by Kobayashi, and the man who wrote the rules, joining me cage side here in Chicago. Third and final round, Kobayashi looking to extend his six-fight win streak, while Landu would like to make it four in a row. It hangs in the balance, according to Big John McCarthy's unofficial scorecard. Lead right. Didn't left kick, I think we've seen that. Deja oh, vu all over again, but he got that. hurt with that left hand from Kobayashi. So Kobayashi rattling Landu with the left after Landu said, hey, it worked the first time, let's do it again. With that punch kick combination and Landu able to split the guard as a explosive shoot by Kobayashi looking to again run the pipe on the single leg, but now it's Landu looking for that double wrist lock. Landu looking to just try to keep his balance right here. Break that grip. Put pressure down on the head of Kobayashi, making it heavy. For him to stand up with that leg. Limp leg out or try, nice but tree top top nicely done in stereo, my man. What's going on tonight, Mr. McCarthy? Pretty good. There's that with the that again, again. North, the sprawl by Kobayashi. So Kobayashi again takes the, the thunder of Landu and it almost makes him go, okay, then I've really got to get to work, and he does. It's like a wake-up call at the beginning of every round, Chris Landu. Landu's gonna be looking for that, that beautiful right hand left high kick again because it's worked twice. And these things happen in threes. That cut has not been a problem whatsoever for Kobayashi. In terms of, I mean, in no, terms of blurring his vision or impacting the fight. It's not affected his eyesight yeah. at all. Which is, oh, good. nice counter right from Kobayashi, the check hook by the Southpaw Landu. There's a front kick. Similar to the kick that Shabli landed on Tofik Musayev that propelled Alexander Shabli into the semifinals of the Lightweight World Grand Prix, where he will meet former champion Patricky Pitbull to kick off Bellator 301's main card as Kobayashi seeks the takedown, running out of real estate, John. Yeah, we're running him all the way into the cage. That's a good position for Lantou to defend. Another point of balance. He's making a mistake by going after that arm because it puts him on his back. He's got to be sure that he uses that to roll Kobayashi through here. Landu looking for a sixth submission. Kobayashi 
That, that's getting it. And this good. is his money Miami maker. needs to ride it up on top. There he goes. Out of his five submissions, three have been via Kimura. Now it's the into, last three. It's into a straight arm lock. Straight arm lock now. He wants to free that left leg. He should pull that leg out. There he goes. He's trying to do it. And it's all with the wrist locks, the submissions. Three Kimura, an Americana, and a key lock. So he's uh, very comfortable and powerful from this position. Kobayashi trying to defend and trying to reverse his fortunes here. Again, he's got to turn his hips, and with his leg caught that by Kobayashi, that's creating a problem for him in being able to torque on that arm. Now his leg is free. He should ride his hips over. There he goes. Minute 45 left in the fight, a scramble. Landu has Kobayashi's left arm caught in between. That's why he's not able to, he was now trying to turn, couldn't do it. And continues to Still looking work for, for that submission. Still looking for it. He's in a good position. Now he's able to trap the head with his legs. And if you can trap the head, that's going to make the torque on the shoulder that much more intense. Kobayashi's been submitted once. That was back in 2015 in the Bellator cage against Goichi Yamauchi. The yeah. rear naked choke. So what Kobayashi is doing is Kobayashi is trying to control that arm with his legs, trying to hold his own shorts. So what you need to do if you're Landu is instead of just pulling, push first to break the grip and then pull. And seconds tick away here in the third round. Oh, he's got it free. He's able to start putting a lot more pressure on it. That is getting tight. His fourth consecutive Kamura. 24 seconds left. Can Kobayashi hang on? That is, it's getting farther and farther away from his body. That is not a comfortable position. He needs to absolutely try to ride his hips towards it. Final 10 seconds. Oh, my goodness. That is nasty right now. It's in a bad position. Wow. Great job. Mamma mia. Kobayashi survives a... Right. Wretched attempt at the Kimura. I mean, the unbelievable. Everyone has a different flexibility oh. in their shoulders, and obviously he's got good flexibility. Yeah, you don't want to play a game of Twister with Kobayashi. Yeah, that was definitely cranked over. This is when Kobayashi was going for that. Single leg, and you saw Landu go for the Kimura grip off it. I wasn't too sure if it was the right idea since he had got caught on his back before, but he was able to hold that. You see Kobayashi trying to push the leg free so he can roll over and actually give up position, which is telling you it's tight. And at the end, this was starting to get a little bit nasty. This is where you're not sure. Everyone's flexibility is a little bit different. But there has started to become a lot of torque on that shoulder right there as that arm folded over. And really, at this point, it's Landu wants to bring the arm up. Kobayashi rolls back over, and it's the end of the fight. And based on what we've just seen in the replays and going for that submission on official scorecard. I have it 29-28 with the winner being Yves Landu. Let's see if Michael C. Williams will echo those words hola, as the hola. scores are being tabulated. Move. So, Isao Kobayashi returning to Bellator, where he was 0-2, riding a six-fight win streak, had some success with the takedown in round two, but in round three, found himself on the verge of being forced to submit an incredible flexibility and pain threshold for Kobayashi. And uh, we now await the official judges' scores, but... Oh, 
always scares me when there's all this time, when you have. Time is the one thing fight, we can't fight, take back. A fight that you think it should have been pretty easy. Where are my scores? But the official decision here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance in tonight's first fight, we'll go to your scorecards. Sal DeMotto, Brandon Mason, Brian Miner at cage side. All seen exactly the same, 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Eva Lander. You know. And Eve Landu with four consecutive wins picks up the unanimous decision win over Isao Kobayashi, who sees his six fight winning streak snapped, and he's still looking for his first win in the Bellator MMA cage. Landu, is he going to land oh, it? He's going to try. <laughs> <That's a laughs> ah, Sticks the landing just like he's. There it is, the pop locking and the break dancing as Eve Landu, hey, a showman as well. As he continues to put on a show for the uh, fans here in Chicago. Where's my bucket hat when I need it? <laughs> exactly. All right. All right, John McCarthy, Boro Ranella with you here at Cage Side. It is Bellator 301, the final event for Bellator here on Showtime and coming up on Showtime later tonight. The main card, we've got a championship doubleheader. One of the most dominant champions in the world in the welterweight champ who was Yaroslav Amosov. Longest active win streak in major MMA, 27-0, but he faces an ultra-hungry challenger in Jason Jackson, who has literally earned his way to a title shot with six hard-fought victories. Jason Jackson has been absolutely incredible in Bellator, and I honestly believe, not just saying it, he's undefeated here. He has a loss and a split decision to Ed Ruth that there was not a doubt in my mind. He easily won that fight, knocked him down three times, but he's got all the tools necessary to beat Yaroslav Amazov. He's long, he's got a 78 and a half inch reach for a welterweight. He has got power, he's got good wrestling, but Amazov doesn't make mistakes. He is almost flawless in the cage and he waits for you to make the mistake and he takes advantage of it. It's going to be a great matchup between Amosov and Jackson. And the co-main event pits two of the best bantamweights on the planet. The champion Sergio Pettis squaring off against the surging World Grand Prix winner Patchy Mix, who is 5-0 with four fantastic finishes since his lone shot at a 135-pound title. But we turn our attention to the lightweights in the cage. It's Mike Hamill, 4-2 and two in Bellator, taking on Tim. Wild, who is four, one and one in the Bellator MMA cage as we go to the four, one, one. Look, when you're taking a look at this fight, Tim Wild loves to be in the stand-up. He's got a big reach advantage at 74 inches to 68, but Hamill's a great wrestler, and he's going to try to get past that range and get this fight to the ground. Here is MC Dub. And for all those joining us tonight on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, we welcome you to Chicago as the prelims here now go to three five minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first out of the blue corner at five foot 11, weighing in 156 pounds even as a professional. 16 wins, four losses, one draw, fighting out of Wolverhampton, England, presenting Tim Wild. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 155.8 pounds. His professional record: 11 victories, five defeats. He fights out of Phoenix, Arizona, by way of Green River, Wyoming. Magic Mike Hamill. And your referee in charge, Rob Madrigal. Magic Mike Hamill has won four straight. Tim, you ready? The experiment. Mike, ready? Tim Wilde undefeated in his last five. They touch gloves the first of a schedule three rounds in the Bellator 155-pound division. And when you break down the tape, John, you know that a guy like Mike Hamill against a guy like Wilde, he's going to want to use that striking to, to try to take the fight down. Oh, absolutely. You know, Mike Hamill knows how good Tim Wilde is in the stand-up. He's got a 
a, a different type of stand-up. He likes to be bladed in a karate stance a lot. He's got a lot of power in his shots. Hamill knows that I gotta use my hands to get me in, get his hands away from his body so I can get into it and try to take him down. Hamill told us you will see a typical Magic Mike fight with high pace, dirty boxing, and maybe some flying expletive if you're lucky. I'll let you fill in the blank as Hamill was going for the shot back take, now has back control on Wild against the fence and puts in the one hook, figure four in that right leg of Tim Wild. That was a great job by Beautiful Hamill job. to close that distance. Now he actually overshot it, but came out on the back. This is exactly where he wants to be. He wants to be putting weight down on Tim Wild, riding him heavy, creating all kinds of damage in the ground and pound situation. Uh, creating all kinds of chaos right now with a scramble <laughs> looking to get control and there's Tim Wilde rolling right into north-south position. Beautiful job by Wilde escaping and delivering a knee on the exit. That's what I was talking about with Tim Wilde. He used to be just a striker, but man, he can roll now and he can get himself back to where he wants and to be. that's because he is hooked up with Renegade MMA, UFC welterweight champion Leon Edwards and the like. We've seen his fight IQ increase, and as you mentioned, John, his wrestling has gotten better. Yeah, you're so right, and he has, he has made huge strides while at Renegade. He's so much better now as a fighter because he's complete. The real question, the one thing we know about Mike Hamill. Oh, we know that he can deliver a right uppercut, and we know that Tim Wilde can take a shot. Dang, that was solid. Hey, it's Hamill that has the four plates in his face, but you got to wonder about Wilde, what he has in that chin, maybe tungsten steel. Yeah, I think it just bounced off of his chest, though. It didn't really catch the chin that he wanted. Yeah, right off the chest. I can see it in, in my yep. monitor there, so. Man, still, the took off the steam, but well-intentioned, and now Hamill fighting for the takedown, and again, the takedown defense being employed by Tim Wilde. Great job by Tim Wilde there. But he's gonna have to do this continuously throughout these three rounds if the fight ends up going that far, because Mike Hamill, he has got an engine, man. He just keeps on coming, he never stops. It's one of the things that I love when I watch him. <laughs> That's one way to stop your opponent. Right. Okay. You ready to go? Good. All right, Wild says he's good. Time. Fighting pride of Wolverhampton, England, and there's the replay. And you side see the sidekick. Cup. It did, it caught, caught it just going down. Oh man, and Wild returns the right uppercut. High kick partially blocked by the wing of Hamill again. Hamill telegraphing the takedown yes, attempt. Yes, he did, exactly right. And that was why Tim Wilde was able to stuff it. And you can see how Tim Wilde, he's getting confident right now. Yep. Footwork, look, look, right look at him move, move himself back to the center of the cage. Nice lateral movement, throws his combination. He's looking really good right now. Just past the midway point of the opening round and more flow, more fluidity from the experiment, Tim Wild. Hamill's fainting, wanting to get Wild to bite. Yeah, he's fainting, but he needs to throw. Oh, there's a left head kick by Hamill. You can faint too much, you gotta throw because the, when you're throwing is when that opportunity to close that gap is gonna come to you. Final minute of the first. Pull two jab from Wild, and there Hamill deposits Wild on his back into side control with 51 <laughs> seconds left in the round, but Wild trying to escape. Very nicely done by Hamill Timely. to hold that position. Beautiful takedown, he held the position because Tim Wild tried to roll through it. He brought him right back to where he wanted to be. He's in that side control position. Let's see if he tries to either move him out or tries to pull it as Tim Wilde rolls, try to grab that back. Under half minute remaining in the first round, Hamill two for five in the takedown department. And you saw Hamill, he stepped himself into half guard. He wanted to be now in the place he felt more control of the hips. And there's Wilde looking for a submission. And there's the knee from Hamill. Fantastic first round between these two aggressive fighters. Mike Hamill, Tim Wilde going to work inside the Bellator cage.
Hey, let's relax a little bit and not feel so hurry. Yeah. You're not moving your feet as well as I'd like to see you move your feet when he goes forward. If we're going to back up, let's back up. No problem. Yeah. And then if he comes forward and you want to go forward, go get him, dog. Hey, we're doing good on the feet. After he got up the first time, you just stopped moving. We gotta keep those veins going the whole time. Just don't slow your feet down. Well, also, if you can keep in the clinch a little bit longer, remember, you can stay there, but you don't have to always disengage. Once he's up in the feet, you right, really be go. there. Okay, good round, Tim. Let's go, let's go. Tim. Mike Campbell. Trains at the one, MMA two, lab. One, two, let's go. Phoenix, Arizona. Tim Wilde with Renegade MMA in, in England. And you heard from John Crouch, the longtime respected trainer at MMA Lab, a black belt under Hoist Gracie. Had a chance to visit with them for the first time in many years in such a class act and so cerebral when it comes to the art of fighting. And of course, led Benson Henderson to all that success as a WEC and UFC champion. You're absolutely right. John is one of the best people you could ever meet in this sport. Super smart and unbelievable. Unbelievably good with the fighters that come out of his camp. As we begin round two, as the there's that casting right hand by Wild. How did you score the opening five minutes? Lots to unpack there. You know, there was a lot to unpack. A beautiful combination very, by Hamill. Very nice by Hamill. But if you look at the overall effect of everything, combining the grappling and the striking, Mike Hamill's the one that pulled that round. And he's trying to pull Wild down here in round two, really working hard to secure the takedown. In his corner, told him to relax a little bit, settle down a, in terms of expending the energy, even though, again, we, his, exactly his conditioning does, is, 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 is all of it. I totally understand John Crouch sure. saying, hey, just settle down, you know. It is Mike Hamill's style to put pressure and to just keep on coming at you. Well, with the Superman punch, there's a right that, hook to the body. That is a very smart attack by Tim Wilde. Go to the body. If you want to slow somebody down, someone that brings a lot of pressure, that body attack will definitely do it. Wilde started training Shotokan Karate when he was eight as a black belt, and so you will see signs of his karate background in his attack as he avoids that right hand from Hamill as he continues to utilize movement. Tim Wilde is Hamill with the whip on that attack to the lead leg. Two minutes have elapsed here in the second. Pace is slow, just a bit more of a tactical affair. What you saw, you saw Wilde actually biting on some of Hamill's feints. And now he's starting to settle in just a little bit more, not quite biting down on him. He's starting to just look and see when he believes Mike Hamill's going to come. Because the, the real effect here is Hamill doesn't worry about Wilde trying to take him down. But Tim Wilde has to worry about Hamill and when he's going to try. Midway through the second round, and Mike Hamill's been credited with only landing the one punch thus far. And there's the kick from Wilde. So Hamill looking to get on track and again leading with that right uppercut. Wild right there in the pocket, continue to use that jab for management of distance, the range finder. Two minutes left in the second. Nice yeah. jab by Tim Wilde. Yeah, from Wilde in the right cross. Speaking of right crosses, we'll see plenty of those. David Benavidez, Demetrius Andrade, two undefeated fighters on Showtime pay-per-view. One week from tomorrow night in Las Vegas. A minute and a half left in the middle frame. Lots of fainting by Hamill. Faints with the knee. Goes back to South Bob Wild now looking to get Hamill to bite Hamill again. Naked shot. Wild trying to stay on his feet, but gets deposited down for the third time in the fight. Hamill's gonna have to do some work here to try to make up a lot of the shots Tim Wild has landed on him. You know, he is behind in my opinion, so he cannot just sit here 
you know, holding position. He has got to get busy, start using ground and pound, or look for a submission. Yeah, Wild has outlanded Hamill 12 to 2 in terms of total strikes here in the second stanza, hoping to use the fence now as an assist to try to sweep Hamill. Well, and you can figure that there's been about 20 seconds on the ground, and you haven't seen really one shot landed by Hamill. He's been able to control position, but he's not been able to open up with any ground and pound. He landed a little bit of an elbow. The struggle is real, as you can hear the breathing, <laughs> the, the energy being They've expended been working. by the both fighters and. And what you see with that leg, what that's telling you is Hamill's putting a lot of shoulder pressure onto Tim Wilde, and so that shoulder pressure, he's taking his leg, grabbing his arm, and pulling his arms to give a little space so he can breathe. And they'll get a chance to catch their breath for 60 seconds. Uh, how do you have it after two rounds, John? After two rounds, I have this as an even fight. I got 19-19. Feel good. To keep that standing momentum off, all he's looking for is to tie down. You can see that's like that's his whole game now. Like he's gonna look for that clinch on you. So we've got Elite keep it a bit busy on the feet. He's looking to keep it very static on the ground. Again, the round was close because he didn't do much for the takedown, but we know what he gets to do now. We've got to have a few big moments on the feet. You know when you're doing that pendulum, don't be scared. Landing those body kicks on open stance. Stay same stance on that jab. You can come over the top with that rear hand too. And if you don't get it, go right to the body. Get right to the body. But your feet are the key to all of it. I'm just sitting in front of him. You got it? Hey, let's fight this one good, smart. We're going to get him. We're going to finish him this round. He's tired too. Hey, he's tired. He's slowing down. Great instruction from each corner as one would expect at this level of the sport. John, would you agree? Absolutely. As the third and final round is upon us. Third and final round, third and final, let's go. One of the things that you heard at the end of that was John Cross saying, you gotta use your feet, meaning that you cannot keep your feet still. You gotta be using your feet to get yourself inside. Don't lean forward, don't chase forward. That's what Mike Hamill needs to do to get into Tim Wilde. Tim Wilde with plenty of success with that full cue jab. Fishing for the head kick, spinning, wheel kick. The wild card in terms of the total strikes landed John a huge edge over Mike Hamill. Mike Hamill trying to make up for it though, trying to land with bad intentions with that right, the right uppercut from Wild. But Hamill has to, as his trainer John Couch, infer, on start unloading. He's got to ratchet up the offensive output. He really needs to start sliding those feet towards his opponent when he decides he wants to go. You got to use your hands to set up the takedown. Also hard to get an offense going when you got that sharp jab of uh, Wild and that long yeah. with right handed you were. It's a lot easier to sit here and talk about it when you're not getting hit in the face. And there was Wild looking for a front kick to the face. There's a body kick from Wild. And you can see Wild is always looking for that right uppercut. He's looking for Hamilton to shoot in, put his head down, and he's looking to catch him on it. Hamill looking to make some magic here in the third round, and Wild looks to keep his undefeated streak alive as well. Both of them come in with momentum in the Bellator lightweight division. That was a nice low kick by Mike Hamill. Bounced off Hamill's gloves, though. Long range jab. Okay. Chopping away at Hamill's lead and he forces him to switch dances. You heard the thud of that. That, that one was a solid shin to the leg kick. His reaction says it Absolutely. Oh, and that one blocked Hamill. The head kick rocked Hamill and Wild going to work with right hand. But Hamill fights back with the right of his own and misses the wheel 
kick. So Hamill trying to retreat, trying to. Oh, right hand! Down goes Hamill! The right hand, it was really one and done, Tim Wild! Sending this crowd into a wild frenzy with that knockout blow. That was just well done by Tim Wild. And once he had him hurt, you saw stalking, taking his time. Beautifully done. Just an outstanding TKO. performance by Tim Wilde. Coming into that second round, he started to take over in the fight. Third round, same thing. Was able to stop everything that Mike Hamill was doing. Let's take a look, if we can, on a replay of that. Tim Wilde sets himself up, and that yeah, high comes the kick right on the neck and jawline. Hamill is seriously hurt. He kind of stuffed the spacing on that a little bit, but that beautiful straight right hand puts Hamill down there. The fight is over at that point. He doesn't even know where he's really at. He's trying to get up, takes a big shot right there. Big time and beautiful win by Tim Wilde. The experiment of success here at Bellator 301. Tim Wilde now undefeated in six fights as he records his seventh knockout and first since 2018. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end at two minutes, 47 seconds into round number three for the winner by TKO Tim. Tim Wilde knocks out Mike Hamill for the first time since Hamill's, well, first loss was via TKO back in May 2017. So Tim Wilde triumphant at Bellator 301. Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. Tonight. Let's go. Bellator Gold is up for grabs. Left, right, yeah, I hit him with that one, two. With two title fights. Bamasov, the Ukrainian champion. Jason Jackson with the victory. Sergio Pettis, spectacular. Mex has stunned the MMA world. Plus a lightweight Grand Prix semifinal battle. You know I'm gonna get my all when I call show, y'all. Bellator MMA, tonight, live on Showtime. Coming up at Bellator 301, the main card, a championship doubleheader. Rafion Stotts, Daddy Sabatello reignite their bitter rivalry with Sabatello looking to even the score here on his home turf. A.J. McKee returns to lightweight action looking for his third straight win at 155 against number five ranked Sidney Outlaw. And it's the second semifinal of the lightweight World Grand Prix to kick things off. Former champion Patricky Pitbull against number two ranked Alexander Shabli. And speaking of action, we continue now in the featherweight division. It's Cody Law clashing with Jefferson Pontes making his Bellator MMA debut. And you can take a look at Jefferson Pontes undefeated at 6-0. Cody Law was there, and he wants to take that O away from, the, from Mr. Pontes. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Tonight here, Bellator 301, the prelims continue in the featherweight division. Scheduled for three five-minute rounds, we introduce first the blue corner at five foot seven, weighing in 145.6 pounds. In his Bellator debut, he enters undefeated with six victories, no losses, fighting out of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, presenting Jefferson Ponte. 
And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner. At 5'9", weighing in 145.4 pounds after making his professional debut inside the Bellator cage. Now he stands with seven professional victories, two defeats by way of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He fights out of Coconut Creek, Florida. Introducing Cody. in charge, Blake Grice. Cody Law bouncing back from his first losing streak as a professional in his last fight, picking up a win over Edwin right, Chavez ready? in June. Ready? Jefferson Pontes expected to come out aggressive, although we wait and see how he will respond to the bright lights of Bellator. Hey, he launches a front kick to the face to, to say hello to Cody Law. <laughs> Well, he comes from a Luta Libre background, meaning that stand-up being Muay Thai-based, a lot of jiu-jitsu. Wrestling's going to be the difference that you see in these two. Cody Law, very good NC2A champion wrestler, where you're not nice. Pontes is going to have a difficult time in trying to get the traditional takedown on Law. Also talked about, of course, well, we talk about all our fights. We do our homework, John, believe it or not. And uh, we do. when we talk about Pontes, we expected him to maybe come out aggressively. But again, you, you never know until you step into the, the biggest stages in the sport well, it, how you're going to react. Exactly. And it's tough. You, you can look at all those prior fights, and he is. He's aggressive. He comes out really aggressive. Well, sometimes the big lights make you go, I think I need to take my time. And respect for Cody Law as well, who is in his 10th professional fight, all under the Bellator MMA banner. And again, coming back from back-to-back -back defeats and trying to pick up some more momentum here against the debuting Pontes. Pontes looking to, well, faint with that head kick and then finally delivers it. Log just glancing blow with the jab. Cody Law is very good with his hands. He comes from a boxing background also, not just a wrestler. So the kicks are the things that you, when you're watching Cody Law, in the stand-up, when he's throwing kicks like that, that's saying that he's working on all his game and everything because his stand-up, the boxing is there. He just needs to incorporate those kicks and start to affect the movement of his opponents. Law works with some of the best in the game at American Top Team Coconut Creek while Jefferson Pontes, he's trained with former Bellator champion Dudu Dantes and MMA legend Jose Aldo. Very nice comment. And there is ATT's Mike Brown. Mike Brown, the wizard, just an unbelievable coach. You talk about a guy who's just, and threes, all and three he thinks punches. about is fighting. That's Mike Brown. Two punches together. One, two. Halfway, halfway. Kick by Pontes, the knee stomp on Law, and Pontes missing him with that right hand. He's starting to swing very wide. It's not always a good thing. Just over two minutes left here in the opening round, deep to the midsection by Cody Law. Again, attacking the, the calf, and there, Bonte setting up the right hand as a bait, looking for the single leg. Now, Law defending well, balanced. Again, not going to be an easy thing for Jefferson Bonte to get as far as that traditional takedown. You see how Cody just fights it off, turns the position. Law told us he felt that his greatest strength is that he is comfortable wherever the fight goes. I, co I know that's part of the, the process for MMA, but not everyone is, John. No, you always have absolutely. your specialties. And uh, in fact, we'll see how things play out in the rematch between Danny Sabatello and Rafion Stotts coming up on the Bellator 301 main card. As Sabatello has told us that, yes, you'll see more offense in terms of striking. We will see he is a wrestling specialist. And now these two reset in the center of the cage. Absolutely. I can't wait for that fight. So, but taking a look at what is going on right now, 
Cody Law is starting to just take, he's starting to feel better about the fight. He's starting to take control of when the engagements are starting to occur. And Jefferson Pontes, the one thing he's got to do is settle down, start throwing straighter shots. Instead of that, it's beautiful. Straight up the middle, nice job. Don't get into winging big, heavy shots that, that you're missing because that's going to take a lot of energy out. Monty's putting on the pressure coming forward. Law with the jab, he's with the right. Final 10 seconds of the first five minutes of this featherweight matchup. Win Trust Arena in Chicago, Bellator 301. And after one unofficial scorecard, sir. Uh, right now, that was Cody Law's round. Jefferson Pontes just needs to be a little more accurate, a little busier. <laughs> no, dude, he's not checking. That's flaming solid every time. Put some, put some mustard on that. And you can put some weight behind that. It's not, dude, that's that's solid, dude. Give him a good one, man. Make sure you're hiding it. Two punches together. Put some weight behind that too. Two, maybe two and three punches. Start dropping his hands middle, right hand to wing it up and throw it again. So he raises the second one, and your hands up, and then counter punch that. Leg going. the leg up with that. Yeah, we'll see him tighten up. His hands will come down. Then he's going to do a big. Yeah. Yeah. Vamos trocar. Para de andar para trás. Vamos andar para frente. Segundo round. Tá mandando muito bem. Agora é a vitória. Não tem como não ter vitória. Vamos ganhar. Como é que tá o gás? Respira. Tá bem? 100%. Pega o banco, Gabriel. Second round. First round contested fully in the stand-up department where Law outstruck Pontes 29 to 9. Here we go. You ready? Round two, round two. Fight! Stay disciplined. And here comes the more aggressive Pontes. Putting the pressure on, looking to hit the home run with the right hand, and you mentioned, John, a little wild in his attack. Yeah, very wild. Nice jab from Law. He's really starting to overextend, and that's when you get caught. You gotta just settle down and just pick your shots. Those big looping shots are not something to start off with. He checked that kick, but then got caught with a combination upstairs from Law. The straighter the shot is, the faster it finds its home. Side low kick scored by Law. Is just trying to find a way close. And now again just swinging wildly and Law secures the takedown, the first takedown of the fight. After 0 for 1 in the opening round. And Luta Libre background that you talked about, John, does have two submission wins. And for Law, he is seven and two with four knockouts and a submission. But here from top position, trying to, there you go, throw some punches and make uh, make the uh, fighter on his back pay. Are you cheering that man up? <laughs> Very nicely done. And Yevin, well, Sweet one good turn Pontes. deserves another. Great escape by Pontes, but here we go. You know, the, the thing a lot of people, when you're looking at, when you see Luto Libre, that's a guy that's learned jiu-jitsu just like the, the wrestler has, mm -hmm. without the gi. He's that's doing right. it with just shorts on, a t-shirt. And so he's not used to all the, the holds of a gi, but he's used to all the hand holds of facing someone like he is right now in Cody Ball. Yeah, Pondy's predicted that this fight would end with him having his hand raised after a submission, but right now against the fence, carrying the weight here of him. Cody Law. Very nice job yeah. again, Cody. For the ankle lock. Looking for heel hook. A there. heel hook. Got to be careful. You're open there. And both, again, going both for guys. it. Yeah, his legs out. Good scramble. Midway point of the round, and Law resets in the center of the cage. And I love that Jefferson was going for that heel hook, but you got to be cognizant of having a guy over you that's able to land punches. You got to be careful where you're leaving your head open, trying to look for that submission. 
Monty's a fan of the Igor Wolf Chanshin approved uh, casting punches. <laughs> of course, Fedor Milianenko used them to the right degree, and boy, he just took a, a shot from La La, then changed levels, and there's old watch those elbows, 12 to 6, almost, not quite, close. Looking good. And what a, again, why can't there be 12 to 6? It's, yeah, let's just be honest, it's ridiculous, it needs to be changed. Wow. And hope, no, hopefully, I hear you. this next year, I'm, I'm, I'm going with it. I'm saying that they're going to do it. Ponte's working from his back. Wow, extending. Look for that Google Plata. Looking for it. Wow. Shimmy Aoki. Nice flexibility there. Yeah, very good flexibility. And he talked about his strengths in the submission department. The only difference you'd like to see is you'd like to see that leg come over the top to pull Cody's back and neck down into it, but it's 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 got La pressure. Law's on. never been finished. His two losses via decision. Just over a minute left in the second. The good news for uh, Law is he, this is all taking place in front of his uh, corner. He is listening to Mike Brown right now. And that's what he needs to do, just start opening up, because you can only take so many more before you have to move. And Bob breaking the grip now with posture and delivering some ground and pound to two. Jefferson Pontis, who is pinned up against the fence. And this is how you start to slowly break down your opponent, make him wonder, another elbow. do I want to still be here? Oh, another elbow across the forehead by Law. And Cody Law continues to extend his advantage in the striking department. Twenty-nine to nine in round one. Round two, twenty for Law. Two strikes for Pontis. Well, he's throwing them. They're just not landing. He's he's winding up and he's throwing these big haymakers that they take a lot of time. They're easy to see, and that's why they're not landing. And Law's done very well in the kicking department. Here was Especially right here. That was a nice shot, but that's the one that made Law say, "Okay, enough of this. I'm going to end up." taking you down. He does a nice job of that. Gets the position. You saw Pontus look for that leg lock. Went for the heel hook. Cody was able to break through it. He took some shots. Then Pontus was able to get to almost a go go plata. He brought the leg up. Here he goes after the heel hook right here. But that's where you're taking that left right, hand. Go, you're guys. taking shots. You got to be really careful how many shots you take in trying to make that submission work. Nick Diaz, Takanori Gomi, one of oh, the famous Coco yes. Plata's ever. And Cody Law looking to make it two in a row after his first Round two three, fight losing ready? streak. Round Jefferson Pontes hopes fight. to be successful, hopes to prevail in his Bellator debut. And he's going to have to make up for a lack of offense thus far. In terms of the strikes, he's also 0 for 2 in the takedown department. Yeah, well, he needs, he needs to have luck land on his side and, and to land one of those big haymakers because he could definitely hurt somebody with it. Yep. But just set it up. Straight shots down the middle and make the last one the big haymaker as he's trying to exit away. Good interception. They're going downstairs. Pontus was looking for the strikes upstairs. And again, total strikes landed, John. I mean, out over 50% for Law. That's sensational. 18% for Pontus. Not as good. Not quite sensational. But he's, he's in the fight. You can see. Well, he's still looking for his ways to land shots. But yeah, the numbers tell a story. They don't always tell the whole story. Keep trapping that tree. But in this chop, case, chop, 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 chop. Cody Law in control. As Pontus again, and you've mentioned it, John, over and over, overextending, lunging into his offensive yep. zone. Not giving himself a chance. And I really think the, the low leg kick that you're seeing Cody Law deploy here is having and, an and get on cue. On cue. On cue and on kick. 
Smart move by Cody Law. Here's a wrestler being intelligent, saying, you know what? And right away, he puts that foot to the back, but he's not the same guy. Look at him. Contest has been compromised as a fighter. Cody Law methodical, setting them in his sights. Pontes looking to try to survive somehow with just over three minutes left. Looking to pull guard, looking for a desperation submission. And there, Law kicking the injured leg. Look, go back to it. You have a chance of getting him out of this fight. But he needs to take his time now. Don't rush in. Just look for those opportunities because as Pontes leans there, nice footwork will put you in range to hit the other leg since that's what he wants to put out there now instead of that left leg. The guts and the heart of Jefferson Pontes on display having problems putting weight on what was his lead leg. Now fighting out of a southpaw position, gets a haircut from Mike or Cody Laws. High oh, kick. That was a shame. <laughs> Oh, nice right hand from Pontes, still standing, and back to Orthodox. You can so, tell Pontes is not comfortable in the southpaw position, so he's having to go back to Orthodox, but that puts what's in the danger zone front. And there's another kick by Cody Law. Pontes going upstairs with the right hand. Under two minutes left in the fight, can Cody Law close the show on the compromise? Jefferson Pontes. And every time Cody Law should be looking, watching that leg, and as he steps up, brings that knee up because he likes to raise it in a Muay Thai fashion. You know it's coming down. Launch the kick as it's starting to come down. And when you don't have balance, more it's so difficult to fight. Oh, the head kick was Bob. Nicely done. And there, modified Minari roll by Pontes looking again for the leg lock. Trying desperately to find a way, but it's Cody Law, top position, half guard. Elbow from Law from top side. Series of elbows. Under a minute left in the foot. Nicely done by Cody Law because look, this is the point where you get in that fight. Pontes didn't realize that he could lose a fight. Now he's in that position. It's like, I don't know how to stop what's occurring. I'm, I'm hurting. He's never been there before, and all these thoughts are going through his head. This is a hard moment to work through. 6 and 0 with four finishes coming into his Bellator debut. Pontes has been in dire straits courtesy of the offense of Cody Law who in his 10th fight all under the Bellator banner, showcasing his well-rounded arsenal. And Montes just neutralizing the hands momentarily. Hammer fist, there's elbows now from Law. Under 10 seconds left in the fight. Cody Law looking to finish, but the clock Pontes. may be his biggest enemy. Pontes cut open. And Pontes is cut. And Cody Law proving to be a cut above here in this matchup at 145. You continue to see growth and maturation in the evolution in Cody Law's game now in his 10th professional fight all, all here in Belgium. Absolutely. And the big thing that I'm seeing is the fight IQ. I was going to say. You saw how he was smart. A guy who his background being in wrestling he hits that leg the man goes down and instead of jumping on top of him steps back says get up that right there oh. says a lot beautiful kick by Cody Law becomes another kick Pontes just off balance unable to land anything with power at that point and here at the end just opening up going after him elbows and punches that was a very Impressive performance by Cody Law, especially in that third round. Speaking of impressive. Dang, look at those numbers right there, Morrow. 81 strikes landed to 15. That is absolutely awesome. And those 28 kicks landed. That was the difference maker in the fight. Judging by the uh, stats, Pontes fought the law and the law won. But we've yet to make it official, BJM. This is true, we have not. And if it goes in any direction other than Cody Law, I then you quit. might have to call the law. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
meaning you can phone yourself. Yeah, there you go. Hey, let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Brian Puccillo, Scott Jones, Eric Colon. I'll have it exactly the same 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Cody Law. Cody Law proves to eight and two in Bellator MMA, spoiling the Bellator debut of the previously unbeaten Jefferson Pontus. And for Cody Law, he continues to grow as a fighter under the ATT learning tree. The new Bellator MMA app is here. New look, new features, new fights. Watch live weigh-ins and prelims. Share your fight picks. Earn points and badges as you rank up to the heavyweight division. And stay up to date on events, rankings, and news. For all the latest features, download the new Bellator MMA app. Available on the App Store and Google Play. Semi-final battle. You know I'm gonna get my all when I call show ya. Bellator MMA tonight, live on Showtime. Bellator 301 prelims continue with action at a contract weight of 160 pounds between Islam Mamedov and Kilis Mota. Two outstanding fighters here. I want to point out that weight of 159.4 to 160. It is a contracted weight. It was done before the weigh-ins ever happened. So this is a contracted weight at 160. Heavyweight cage announcer, Michael C. <laughs> Williams. And good evening to those joining us in the UK on BBC iPlayer here in Chicago. The prelims go now to a contract weight of 160 pounds, scheduled for three five minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot 11, weighing in 160 pounds, even his professional record 15 victories, three defeats, presenting Killes Mota. And across the cage is adversary out of the red corner at six foot weighing in 159.4 pounds as a professional. 22 victories, three losses, one draw. Introducing Islam Mamedov. And your referee in charge of the action, Jason Herzog. Islam Mamedov holds a victory over former Bellator lightweight champion Brent Primus, Gilles Mota, in search of his fourth consecutive win. Scheduled for three five-minute rounds First and a round, contract you weight you ready? of 160 pounds. Medov looking to bounce back from a loss to Sydney Outlaw this past August. Outlaw will face AJ McKee in lightweight action as part of the main card of Bellator 301 later tonight at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. On showtime as Moda comes forward, missing with his first offensive foray as he goes downstairs with a calf kick. But it, it's really important for Achilles Moto to continue that pressure because you want to put Mamadov on his back foot. Mamadov on his back foot is not near as aggressive with his wrestling and he doesn't throw shots in the same fashion. He needs to be coming forward to be really offensive. Sharp jab to the midsection. Better counter upstairs by Moda with the right oh. hand as they clinched a double collar tie by Mamadov. As Motov 
putting the pressure on him now, but Mamedov very aggressive along the fence. Yeah, there was a moment where you saw their heads actually come together. It was the top of Moda's head, and I believe the jaw of Islam Mamedov. Yeah, that was a clean clash of heads, actually. Unfortunately for Mamedov, it was his jaw. Mamedov utilizing that wizard to get back to his feet. There's short knee strikes by Mota. Pummeling against the fence as Mamedov looking for dominant position, a way to change the position. Well, in watching a lot of Achilles Motors fights here in Bilter, we've, we've grown to know that physically he's very strong. He's hard to move. He's got a really good grappling game. His wrestling is strong. And since he's been at ATT, he's really come along with his conditioning, which was sometimes in question as far as he would have to back off and take a breath. Now he just continues to push. Yeah, two great camps represented, as you mentioned, Moda at ATT. Mamedov also working with AKA in San Jose. And of course, Abdul Manav Namagamedov Fight School in his native Dagestan, as we are just. Well, we've reached the midway point of the opening round and trying to find every inch of opportunity. Finally, Mamedov able to break, reset, but on his back foot, backing up to the fence again. The pressure from Moda, but there's a right cross from Mamedov. And that's nice, but this is exactly what Moda wants to do is do not let him feel comfortable and have him start coming forward. He's either going to have to stand his ground or he's going to be going backwards. And that is a great game plan by Moda. Three minutes have elapsed here in the opening round. And Moda goes to the body left hook. Mamedov now trying to get on track. There's a long range jab to the midsection. Lifelong wrestler and oh, nice right hand left hook combination by Mamedov. And that was a nice lead uppercut. And that's something you see in nice MMA team. a lot more than you see in a boxing match it's because of the fact that you're feigning that there's a shot coming and they start to lower their hands. And Although Marcos Maidana used it to great affection against <laughs> Adrian Broner, setting up the Just jab and the left hook knockdown. Under a minute left in the first round, Mota and Mamedov jockeying for position, a war of attrition here, just grinding away against the fence, and Mamedov looking for the, the trip takedown, the outside trip, and if he gets it to the campus, that's really where he's most comfortable and in his domain. That is where he feels very comfortable, and in the top position, he's super heavy, got a lot of pressure, but he's gonna have a, he's gonna find it very difficult to bring Mota down with the normal takedowns that he's comfortable with. You see him with this, over under lock and he's normally able to get a trip in here and pull the pressure, get someone off of their feet. It has not worked once against Moda. Tá muito bem, tá muito bem. 
Vamos ficar só ligado nos isolados. Another lifer in the MMA game, Conan Silvera at ATT, and what a great fighter in his own right back in the day. Well, what a job he's just done as a coach. He's been so good for ATT, and, and now people are searching him out because he understands the mental aspect, the physical aspect. He's a great coach. Third. This is now the second of three rounds at a contract weight of 160 pounds, and oh. Ota finds his way in with the combination. Yeah, that definitely got Mamedov's attention. That was a clean right hand. Lead left hook by Mota, and again, the left hook to the body, but Mamedov able to angle off. Jab from Mamedov. Really nice job by Moto pairing off a lot of those shots. And doing a good job of trying to defend here in beautiful butterfly hooks, looking for that elevator sweep right at the takedown by Mamedov. And Mamedov now is Moto not making it easy for him from his back. Uh, he's making him work and he's. he's Making Mamedov actually have to sit back with his hips so his hips don't get light. But as we have talked about, this is where Mama made Mama made up. Mama, made Mama up. Mia made, made up. up. Uh, Mama made up is is definitely his most comfortable. Top pressure. One of his strengths. <laughs> But this is, if you're in the Moda camp, this is what you want to see in terms of how he's trying to defend, not accepting this position and doing his best to try to stay off his back. Which he's doing. He, he actually allowed Mamedov to pass into side control. Now he's giving up his back to try to get himself to the cage to stand up. And he is able to stand up, but it is Mamedov with back control. Takes him back to the mat. And this is a Dagestani special. Anytime I can, you want to stand up, I'll let you get up and I'll return you to the mat. Honorary this... citizen is mat <laughs> return. Absolutely. And they like to get into where they get the takedown. They call it flying Dagestani air. Yeah, always a turbulent ride. <laughs> turbulent flight. And of course, the Dagestani handcuffs, of course, wrist control. They, they've really uh, obviously done a tremendous job. And it all begins with Habib Nurmagomedov, who yeah. retired with the really his father. Winning yeah. squad. His father, right. but in terms of the, yes, the fighters absolutely. who look up, but absolutely, absolutely. Abdulmanov Nurmagomedov, the patriarch. And both guys really working hard at takedowns, but even when getting the takedown, like Mamedov was able to get, he wasn't able to do anything with it. There was no damage at all in the ground only time Habib Nurmagomedov retired at 29 and 0 of course main event later tonight Yaroslav Amosov 27 and 0 defends the welterweight title against Jason Jackson yeah and you, you think about what it takes and you know we were talking earlier Fedor Emelianenko had one fight against Tsiyosha Kosaka that he lost or it wasn't a loss because it was and the, then the no contest with the headbutt with Nogueira he could have been 31 and 0 exactly with those two no contest before he ran into Fabricio Verdun, but in any event, just over a minute and a half left here in the second, and it continues to be, I, I continue to the word, use the word attrition, John, because they are just stuck against the fence, just trying for every small inch, trying to find a way to impose their will and skill. And, and I know it looks like, oh, you know, they're just holding on each other. There's so much energy being used right here. This is grueling for both guys. A lot of strength, energy, everything being employed. And referee Jason Herzog used a little energy saying, come on, guys. Yep. Oh! Just right there, but not, and this is what happened. This is the new MMA, because, you know, it used to be, you were as good a wrestler as, we'll say, my Madoff is. You're able to get those takedowns. Up. It's not easy to get a takedown in MMA anymore. You have really got to be superior in that area or work incredibly hard to get that. Two for four in the takedown department thus far tonight from Mamedov. Motaz 0 for 1. 30 seconds left in the middle stanza. 
And Mamedov opening up briefly, allowing himself to get away from the fence and just missing the spinning back fist was Kiris Mota. As he's looking for something dramatic, right hand by Mamedov, but Mota used it to time the crashing of the uh, space, the crushing of distance, John. Again, putting Mamedov on the fence. And he got double unders. You see Mamedov trying to dig that underhook in there. Close round. Então você ligado em mim agora. Olha para ele. Olha para ele. Olha para ele. Olha para ele lá. Tá caído. Olha como é que você tá. Não interessa. That's exactly. He's tired. Look at yeah, I know my Portuguese. He's tired. Russia and Canada has two official languages. I have difficulties with both big time. Uh, talking aside, John, third round, uh, important one, very much so with what's happening, because you mentioned it. Even the stats, very close. How do you have it after 10? Both guys, I, I look at that round, it was so close that really the takedown was the only difference maker. So I'll say I'll give it to Mamedov. I think it's anybody's fight. They got both have to go after it in the third round here. And the fans here at Win Trust Arena in Chicago hope that there is that sense of urgency and they let it all hang out here in the final five minutes of this contract weight fight at 160 pounds. Islam Mamedov in the red gloves looking to bounce back from a loss to Sydney Outlaw while Kili's Mota, he's on a three fight winning streak coming off a victory over Kenneth Cross at Bellator 294 back in April via second round rear naked choke. Mota looking to put together some combinations. Yeah, Mota's in that position where he wants to throw those combinations, but he doesn't want to overextend and allow Mamedov to get into that clinch body lock position that he likes so much. Lateral motion in anticipation of the counterattack from Mota. Minute has already elapsed here in the third. Spinning back is just grazing the beard of Mameda. <laughs> being very hesitant in making a mistake. Moda needs to just think about it. He's going to throw his hands straight down the pipe. Straight shots are going to get there, and they're going to go in the direction that Madoff wants to come at him. Moda able to close the discipline. Beautiful takedown by Islam Mamedov. Using Moda's momentum and belly-to-belly -belly suplex almost take down there drop. by Mamedov. Yes, the... Dagestani utilizing his wrestling background and under three minutes now left here in the final frame. Halfway mark of the final round, Mamedov now looking to Continue to control Moda, but Moda doing a great job off his back throughout the fight and not allowing Mamedov to get comfortable in his office. You're looking at Moda looking for a deep half here, trying to get the hips of Mamedov just a little bit light. Unable to get there. Final two minutes of this bout. Madoff three for five in the takedown department. Leads in strikes 
in this final round seven to three right now very close in the striking department and it could come down to what transpires here in the next minute and 40 seconds. Mamedov has 10 submission wins and now has Moda on his back looking for Moda's close guard. But for Moda, time is slipping away because as you stay on your back here, if you're not throwing up submissions and putting him on the defensive, everyone's going to look at that he's the offensive fighter. Short strikes from uh, Madoff to continue to keep Moda distracted. Minute left in the fight. And when you're seeing Moto with that closed guard like that, that's telling you that he's staying there. He's not going to be going anywhere. He's actually holding on to the body of Mamedov. Mamedov's 27th professional fight, Mota's 19th. And Mamedov said that his biggest advantage would be his overall experience. We are down to the final 15 ticks. has enough energy to say he's landing nothing, That's landing it. nothing. Well, you've got to make sure that you land something. He's doing enough to keep you where he wants you to be and you can't get up, so obviously there's something there. So they go the 15. Decision will go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Brian Puccello.
29 to 28, scoring the fight for Mamidov. Your second judge at cage side, Scott Jones, scores at 29 to 28. He sees the fight for Mota. Your third and final judge at cage side, Eric Cologne, 29 to 28. Seeing it for the winner by split decision, Islam Mamidov. Split decision, Islam Mamedov snaps Kilis Mota's three-fight winning streak. Mamedov bounces back, and he's now three and two inside the Bellator MMA cage as Bellator 301 rolls on. Streets Bellator fans head to bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. Tonight, let's go. Bellator Gold is up for grabs. Yeah, fight, yeah, hit them with that one, two. With two title fights. Bamasov, the Ukrainian champion. Jason Jackson with the victory. Sergio Pettis, spectacular. Mex has stunned the MMA world. Plus a lightweight Grand Prix semifinal battle. You know what, my all when I call Bellator MMA tonight, live on Showtime. Welterweights are in the cage as we go to the tail of the tape for this matchup between the undefeated Ramazan Kuramagomedov and the debuting Randall Wallace. And as you look at the physicality, well, we got Wallace seven years older than Kura Nagomedov. Let's go to MCW. Tonight here at Wintrust Arena, the prelims here at Bellator 301 continue now with welterweight set for three five-minute rounds as we introduce first the blue corner at 5'11", weighing in 170.4 pounds, making his Bellator debut. He's bringing 20 professional victories, nine losses, one draw, presenting Randall Braveheart Wallace. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 171 pounds, even with a spectacular first round knockout in his Bellator debut. He remains undefeated, now holding 11 professional victories without a defeat. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Ramazan Guadamagamedal. In charge, your referee, Mike Simarusi. 84 seconds is all it took for Kuda Magomedov to knock out Jaleel Willis in his Bellator right. debut right. in June. Right. Randall Braveheart Wallace in his 32nd professional fight, finally making it to the big time. And Wallace has won five in a row, although his last eight fights have gone the distance. And Kuda Magomedov already testing the waters with the oblique kick, but Wallace putting on the early pressure. It's good pressure by Wallace. I've watched Wallace on the California scene for a number of years. Tough guy, just up against a monster in Kurmagomedov. An incredible story. When Wallace was two, he was found in his... Oh, oh wait a minute, right hook from Kuda Magomedov as Wallace went down momentarily but buckled his knee. Needless to say, he almost drowned at the age of two. His mother, who never practiced CPR, breathed into her son's mouth. Needless to say, he's now here in the Bellator cage, but he is in tough against Ramazan Kuda Magomedov, who's already thrown some heavy leather. Um, Kermaga Meganov's trying to drown him again because, man, he is all over him with big shots. Wallace has done a great job of surviving some of those because he got tagged. He's just trying to collect himself and make it through another head kick. Right hand to the body by Wallace. There's a beautiful hook kick by Kuda Magomedov. Okay, and then the left hook from Wallace. Hook 
around the guard of Kudamagomeda by Wallace and then Kudamagomeda oh. back front kick. He's just got beautiful range and the ability to understand the distance that he needs to cover to land the shot. Changes levels looking for the takedown and secures it on Wallace along the fence. Kudamago Medov from working out of American top team whose training partners include Bellator middleweight champion Johnny Evelyn, Bellator vet Dalton Rasta, and kickboxing great Artem Levin, one of his coaches along with Mike Brown, and now the back take. Your fingers out. He's trying to sweep out that left leg of Wallace. Get rid of the post and bring him down to the canvas. Oh, self-caught left hand right to the nose and that Kick by Kudo Magomeda, partially blocked. Well, he has landed a lot of shots so far. And at 50%, 54% success rate. And we're talking a lot of them with power. Oh. Yeah, he pops his head back like the proverbial Pez dispenser with that jab. And oh, their beautiful it. setup uses the left hand to set up the level change right into the takedown. An amazing performance thus far by Ramazan Kudamagomedov in his 12th professional fight against a veteran in Randall Braveheart Wallace. It's been an offensive onslaught for the undefeated Kudamagomedov. Out striking Wallace 22 to 2. Kudamagomedov 2 for 3 in the takedown department. He has just done anything he wants in this fight so far. When he wants to stand and throw kicks, he's throwing beautiful kicks, even hook kicks. Then he goes with his hands, big power, knocking Wallace down. And then when he wants to take him to the ground, drives in, takes him down. 27 years of age, just entering his physical prime. And that's the scary part when you think about it. You look at someone with that much talent that is able to do whatever they want in the cage at this point. Man, just think in a couple years where he's going to be at. Butterfly got by Wallace, but unable to stop the attack of Kuda Magomedov. Under a minute left here in the first round, it is all Kuda Magomedov. Got five submission wins and now against the fence. So it's going to be tough, although if there would have been space, he would have looked like he was jumping to the other side with the arm triangle. And now Wallace trying to use that fence to reverse his fortune. He was still looking for it. Now Wallace is really good with his defense. He understands yeah, exactly yeah. where he's at, what he needs to do. It's just that at this point, he can't stop the attacks. Ramazan Ramazan Kuda Magomedov with a superlative start to this matchup here at Bellator 301. Easy up, it's wrong. Thank you, gentlemen, thank you. I need some heavy shots, buddy. You're not throwing your two. I need two, three. All right? Set up that hook with the straight right. Here you see some of the shots. It's a beautiful right hand. Put Wallace down. The kick knocks him to the ground. And then he lands the left hook as he's getting up. Just whatever he wanted to do. Beautiful kick right up the middle. The teeth up the middle. What kick? And now I'm going to go for a takedown, land my shot, get my takedown. Kermagomedov did whatever he wanted in that round. Beautiful Very example impressive. of utilizing the striking to set up what he really intended to do. Panel. Round two. Round two. Go. Hey. And we are seeing round number two. Another kick to the head there by Kuda Magomedov. And determined Wallace marching forward after getting 
buried by Kudam Magomedov offensively in that first five minutes. No quit in the veteran coming forward looking to. Nice parry of that left hand by Wallace. Well, if you were listening during the break there, you heard. There's that knee. Oh, wow! Four punch combination. Wallace being stapled to the fence yet still standing. I'll tell you what, he definitely is taking some heavy shots and hanging in there. But even his corner said, you're taking too many big shots. Well, he just took a few big more. I said they just added a couple more. Yeah, on man. Some crushing combination by Kuda Magomedov, and he has utilized every weapon at his disposal. A varied, dynamic, aggressive, and dangerous attack. Again, just 27 years of age and 11 and 0 to start his professional career and following up what was a sensational Bellator debut with that 84 second knockout Jaleel Willis thanks to the knee Here, nice job of lacing the arm behind now he's got Wallace's right arm trapped he's got that Dagestani handcuff mm -hmm. Pick your shot team just leave, yeah? opening up opened up a cut on Wallace's above his left eye. He's opened him up like a double click and everything was clicking for Ramazan. Kuda Mago made off three minutes left here in round number two. And again take a look that arms trapped and he's just jackhammering with that left hand. Wallace, uh, Wallace doesn't have the key to the handcuff. <laughs> no he does not. Unfortunately there he goes he's got his hands free now but He's just taking a pound. Just taking a pound. 245, and it is all Kuda Magomedov. But the 34-year-old Randall Wallace, who again has been through so much, his family has conquered many forms, as he told us, of abuse, trauma, broke generational curses, and he believes he's still just scratching the surface of what is possible for his life. Well, he made it to Bellator MMA. That's the good news. The bad news is he's facing Ramazan. Kuda Magomedov. He got that right. I could have said that better. It's like, well, welcome to your opportunity, and here you go. Sometimes, you know, you, you just you got to just hang on for moments and just sit there and try to figure out what you can do to try to become offensive and do something that's going to slow your opponent down. Right now, I'm not sure that Randall Wallace has found any, any answer to that. Elbows from the bottom, but a better elbow from up top. It's amazing what happens when you have gravity on your side. A minute 45 left here in the second. There's a guard pass by Kuda Magomedov. Back take of uppercut underneath, and now perhaps looking for a choke. Looking for that rear naked choke. Kuda Magomedov has five submission wins. Looking for his first via RNC. He's got one hook in now. Now he's got both. It's and Ramazan Kuda Magomedov improves to 12 and 0 with his first rear naked choke submission. His sixth submission overall. His second sensational performance in the Bellator MMA cage, 2-0, one KO, one sub. Doesn't get better than that. That's what you're looking for. Let's take a look at some of the action this fight. Beautiful flying knee, and this is where you gotta look at Randall Walls and go, man, you have got a chin. You took some big shots. That was clean, that hit him, then the left hand, right hand. Now he's looking for a place to hide, and I don't blame him. And here comes the end when he finally gets, you should watch him get this hook in. He's got control of it. It's already tight. Rear naked choke win. Beautiful performance by Kermagomedov. He vanquished Jaleel Willis with a knee. He takes care of Randall Wallace with an RNC. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Three minutes, 49 seconds into round number two. The tap by way of a rear naked choke for the winner by submission. Still undefeated, Ramazan 
Kudamagomedov. Kudamagomedov wanted to showcase that he is a fighter at the championship level. Consider it a Consider success. It <laughs> yes, as we say hello for the first time to the folks at the fight desk. Let's say hello to Amanda Guerra and Josh Thompson. Moro, Big John, you guys have been doing a great job, but the party is here in Chicago. Josh, what is up, friend? It's always, the party's always here at the desk. It is at the desk. Those and by the way, guys. since we're, we're on YouTube still, tall, long, and lanky, I listen to your podcast. I know a lot of people are looking for those words because we have a lot of tall, long, lanky, am I saying that's it? There tall, long, and lanky. Tall, long, and lanky. Um, look at the fight card we have coming up tonight in our main, or our main card. Uh, absolutely incredible. Two championship fights. I want to talk about the top one, the welterweight world championship between Yaroslav Amosov and Jason Jackson. Yaroslav Amosov, 27 in 0. That is the longest active winning streak right now in MMA. But Josh, you have said Jason Jackson is going to give him the fight of his life. He's going to give him the fight of his life because of the style of his body. That tall, long, and lanky, the speed, his ability to stop takedowns. But Amosov is a technician. He's someone that can do it everywhere. The two of them are a great matchup for a great card tonight. I'm looking forward to it. That's one tall, long, and lanky from you. Everybody at home, you know what to do. Moro, we're going to send it back down to you. All right, take that shot, my friends, as we look for more shots here in the Bantamweight division. Mateos Matos against Richard Palencia, and both of their reach at 67 inches. I mean, physically, they are very similar with Matos being two years younger. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Tonight from Chicago, Illinois, the prelims continue with three five-minute rounds now in the bantamweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot six, weighing in 136 pounds. Even his professional record: ten wins, just one loss. Out of Phoenix, Arizona, Richard Relentless Valencia. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot five, weighing in 135.2 pounds as a professional 13. Victories, two defeats, one draw from the Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, presenting Mateos Adamas Matos. The referee in charge, Rob Madrigal. So Mateos Matos. Coming off a victory Richard, over C.J. Hamilton, a TKO triumph, while Richard Palencia, he's coming off a TKO loss to C.J. Hamilton. That was due to a leg injury, so common opponent C.J. Hamilton, and for Palencia looking for his first win in Bellator, looking to bounce back against Matos here tonight. And Matos, John, we've talked about it, known as a powerful striker, especially at 135, and he throws a lot of different techniques. There's a ton of techniques. His first fight here in Bellator was against Magomed Magomedov, where he had some beautiful techniques. Magomed was able to utilize his grappling and hold him down a lot, but man, when it gets to the stand-up, Matos is explosive. For Palencia, 10 and one has three submission wins, looking for his first knockout victory. He's a fan of quotes like yours truly. He told us about the Napoleon Hill quote. Victory is always possible for the person who refuses to stop fighting. And Matos went to the body with that jab. And we've seen that uh, illustrated many fights tonight, John. And we, we talked about it, something becoming more common. Look, body shots. Body shots work. They wear your opponent down. They make it to where he drops the hands. It makes it to where their gas tank is not as good. It's becoming more and more effective in the world of MMA. Matos has four first round finishes, including three knockouts. A minute and a half already elapsed here in the first. Good counter by Matos, says Valencia. And Matos fighting for position. Valencia was deciding that he wanted to get in the clinch. He got there. Shoulders strikes from. Matos didn't end up in the position that he wanted to be, though. Matos has seven knockout victories, and of course, has that 
win over CJ Hamilton the last time he was in action, but it was a while back. Back both of them John. It's been a while since they've been been. inside the Bellator MMA cage. Looking to reintroduce themselves. Valencia putting a lot of weight on that front leg. Needs to be just a little bit cognizant of the fact when Matos is there. Either throw the shot or back yourself out so you can't get that leg eaten up. Head kick blocked by Valencia, but Matos continues to fire. Valencia really trying to sit down and throw heavy shots. And nothing yet yep. for his efforts. <laughs> Counter right by Ad or Matos Adamos. Adamas Matos Adamas, Greek for diamond, and he wants to shine bright like one here tonight. Each of them. Looking to download that all important data using things. Not fully committing. Matos needs to keep going back to that leg kick. It's going to have an effect. Nice duck and rip there by Matos with the left hook. Okay. Okay. There's a jab that lands for Valencia. Less than a minute remaining in opening round. Wild right hand, and there's the level change by Valencia looking for that takedown defended by Matos along the fence. Nice work by Matos, putting pressure down on the head. But you got to be careful of keeping those legs splayed because you start to put pressure down, and your legs start to come together. You're allowing, you're putting your opponent right where he wants to be and getting his hands clasped together to get that takedown. And right now you can see Palencia just got his fingers together. And able to momentarily put Matos down. Matos looking to pop right back up, posting with that left arm. Nice little switch by Matos. Scramble. Ten seconds left in the first round. Just keep walking it over. If he keeps walking over, he's going to end up in that top position. Feeding plenty of shots. Like nice oh, way to end the round. And a shutout according to our stats in terms of strikes. Mato 16, Palencia, the big goose egg. And both 0 for 1 in the terms of uh, takedowns, John. So having said that, unless, uh, what was the, who was the only one who went around never to throw a punch, Willie Pep? That's what they say. I still don't know how you would do that. I don't either. <laughs> so you're saying that Palencia didn't win the round on your honest no, score? He did right? not. He did not. I know I'm being hard there. Oh, listen. Nice hey, touch that jab a few. That makes him start parrying, then feint the jab. 3 2. Step in on it. Because he's parrying hard when you're clapping him. Breathing, breathing. Every time you make it, Up, fighting out of the MMA lab under John Crouch, MMA veteran Rob Emerson, also training him with the likes of Benson Henderson and Sean O'Malley. Making waves in his own right. Body kick there by Adamo Armatas, who is in the red gloves, Palencia in the blue, and Palencia really has to get his offense going here in the second stanza. Just like you just saw there, you see he bit down on that leg kick and fired a straight left. Matos bearing the 
jab of the southpaw, Palencia, Palencia angling off. Nice right hand the body by Matos. Down to right, left hook by Matos. Palencia just having a little bit of difficulty in finding the, the right range. Mm -hmm. Oh, he, he just took a good with the right cross. He just took a good combination. He's got a good chin, I'll tell you what, he took some good shots right there. He has he been. Circled himself right back into the middle of the cage. Yeah, he has been stopped once, but as we mentioned, last fight against Hamilton, October 22, but that was due to leg injury, even though he was on the receiving end, but uh, Valencia, Looking to find the range and looking to put together a sustained offensive attack as he wants to get Matos to bite down in his face. Meanwhile, Matos delivers a body kick. Now that was a leg kick, and you could see as he ate it, Valencia was starting to wince. Three minutes left in the second. Front kick by Matos. Right up the middle, beautifully done by Matos. Oh, oh, nice right hand ball. by Palencia. The equalizer by Palencia. He's now on the attack, but a good recovery by Matos. But he felt the right hand of Palencia, and that is the sport of MMA. Anything can happen. And now Palencia looking to recover, but it's Matos in top position. Wow. What a shot. Boy, there was a range finder on that one. Yeah. On the right range, put him down. Matos did a beautiful job of coming back and ending up in the top position here. Yep. So a An open momentary up. window of opportunity for Richard Palencia, and Palencia's been opened up. He opened up a little cut on the right corner of the eye. Final two minutes in the second. Valencia wanting to perhaps walk, walk, try to get back to his feet as Matos continues with the body lock, now looking to take the back, gets the hooks in, and immediately goes for the rear naked choke. He's able to hide that hand, he can't pull it down, he's in trouble, he is in trouble. And that's the fifth submission win for Mateus Matos, the second via rear naked choke. As he overcomes momentary adversity being dropped by Palencia before putting the finishing touches on the fight and submitting Palencia for the first time as Palencia, after starting 10-0, has now tasted defeat back to back. But tonight belongs to Matos. That was a beautiful recovery by Matos and then just went after him. Well done. Because he, he definitely took a big right hand. There was no doubt about it. Let's see, let's see what occurred throughout that series. Valencia was having a hard time, but that straight right hand, it found the mark. Now you saw he was able to recover as he was going down, but the right hand was there. But from that moment, he comes right back. Palencia goes after him, doesn't land a whole lot more. And then when he gets the back here, Palencia makes the mistake of letting him not only get the hook, but sink that arm around his neck. And then look at him. He hides the hand with his chin. He's just nicely putting pressure too much for Palencia to withstand. And he gets the tap out to the rear naked choke. Beautifully done by Matos. It's been seven years since Matos has recorded a submission win. That too was via rear naked choke. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, the official time, three minutes, 20 seconds into round number two. The tap by way of a rear naked choke for the winner by submission, Matos Adamon. Matos. Matos improves to 13, 2, and 1 with his 12th finish. Let's go to Amanda Guerra at the fight desk.
Moro, thank you so much. Uh, congratulations to him. What a submission there. Taking a look at our main card coming up tonight, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Showtime. Two championship fights. Let's talk about the Bantamweights going at it. Our champion, Sergio Pettis, versus the guy who won the Bantamweight World Grand Prix. Patchy mix. Sergio Pettis wasn't in that. He was injured. Josh, Sergio Pettis is a champion. Patchy mix has been on one of the biggest tears in MMA. He's so impressive right now. A lot of people think he is the best man of weight in the world. Talk to us about this fight. Well, with Patchy Mix, he's you learn a lot from losses, and I think the fact that he lost to Juan Archuleta, it was one of the most significant things in his career because it was it enabled him to refocus on what he had to get done. Stop being so aggressive. Learn how to fight and use your fight IQ to get the wins and the victories. That fight taught him a lesson, and he's been on a tear ever since. Sergio Pettis is getting tired of being overlooked. He's somebody that constantly is being underestimated, and he comes out and proves them wrong every single time. And look, let's be honest. He wants to get out of his brother's shadow. He's been out of it. I don't understand this. I don't understand this part where he's creating his own path. It's Sergio time right now. Yep. And I'm in my, I love this and I love it about him, but he's coming out and he's exploding on the scene. He told us this week it is Serge time. I absolutely love that. Uh, it's going to be an incredible fight between these two guys. Mora, we'll send it back down to you to continue the prelims. All right, we are set for action in the flyweight division between Kerry Taylor Melendez and Sabri Sengel, and things got a little heated at the weigh-ins, Mr. McCarthy. Well, she just kissed her fist. You can't kiss someone's fist. The kiss that don't miss. <laughs> it's a little bit of heat between the two, but we'll see. The best part, all of that doesn't matter, because I say, when you get in the cage, you get to punch them right in the middle of the mouth. As we go to the tail of the tape, undefeated Kerry Taylor Melendez against the 3-3 the three and three Sabri Sengel, looking for her first win in Bellator. Yeah, and Carrie Melendez, very long, tall. She got a 67.5 reach compared to a 64. Now, both are very good with their striking. It is going to be the difference of the ground game, and if it comes to be part of the fight. All right, it's time for the official introductions. For that, we go back to the center of the cage and Mr. Michael C. Williams. And for those that have just joined us on the live stream on YouTube at both channels, Bellator, MMA, and Showtime Sports, we welcome you to Chicago here at Wintrust Arena. The prelims continue now as we move to the flyweight division. Scheduled for three five-minute rounds, we introduce the blue corner. At five foot five, weighing in 125.6 pounds, her professional record three and three, fighting out of and representing the country of Turkey, presenting Sabri Shagui. And across the cage, her adversary, fighting out of the red corner, at five foot six, weighing in 126.6 pounds as a professional. She stands with five wins, no defeats, fighting out of San Francisco by way of Van Nuys, California, introducing the undefeated Carrie Taylor Melendez. And when the bell rings in charge, you referee Blake Grice. Melendez, married to former Strike Force lightweight champion Gilbert Melendez, Scrap Pack Ready? members Jake Shields Ready? and Nate Fight. Diaz just making their presence known at Cape Side to support Kerry Taylor Melendez taking on Sabri Shukwi, who is looking to bounce back from a submission defeat in her Bellator debut against. Denise Kuhlholz, and of course, she has celebrated a birthday recently, turned 35 last Monday, and she's already tasting the striking acumen of Melendez. Well, we've seen Carrie Melendez before. Her striking is outstanding, but the thing that really has made her special now is she now has a ground game. She has been working on it. She now takes the fight to the ground when she wants does a beautiful job in body positioning and setting up submissions, so she's got the full package. Now, since fighting in Bellator, where she made her professional debut against Q Holtz back in 2019, 
Shukwi has gone a three and two coming off a win in March via TKO. A minute gone here in the first. Oh, again, we've seen Shukwi and she's got great kickboxing. She will, she'll stand in there and she will throw. But when Denise Kielholz took her to the ground, she looked almost like a fish out of water and was very upset that Denise didn't stand with her. And it's like, no, it's MMA. Don't get upset, learn. So we'll see if she learns if Carrie ends up taking her to the ground. Check left hook by Melendez. 90 seconds. Gone by in the first. Overhand right by Shukwi. Shukwi now throwing with bad intentions. Single collar tie. The knees up the middle by Melendez doing damage to Shukwi's body. That knee right up the middle definitely dug in and did damage. Shukwi felt it. You can see her react to it. Yeah, you can hear Carrie Melendez's husband Gilbert saying she did not like that knee to the body. Get back to doing it. And there is El Nino Gilbert Melendez. Let's listen in. Good. Knee, left forearm knee. Good. Left forearm knee. Yes, again. Stay here, Carrie. You're doing good. Again. Again. Keep her here. Great work. Left forearm. Right forearm, right elbow, left elbow. Good. Elbow knee. Elbow knee. Take your time. Wrap her head. Good. 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 Again. Keep her here, Carrie. Breathe. Left elbow again. Over and over, babe. Shoulder bump, right shoulder bump, left elbow. Shoulder bump. Good. Again. Foot stomp, two. Good. Yes. Yes. I can do this all night. I this commentary from El Nino, of course, Melendez and our Josh Thompson, responsible for one of the best trilogies I've ever witnessed in MMA during the Strike Force days here on a Showtime. And now his wife, Melendez, doing a good job of controlling Shotway. Sorry for interrupting you, Mr. Melendez. <laughs> Take your time, elbow knee. Good, grab them. Hey, lock your hands, Gary. Lock your hands. Lock your hands, take her down. Lock your hands, take her down. Good, good. Stay, keep her there. So nice, Gary, great to work. Turn the tables, they jockey for elbow position, knee. and Melendez happy over with what he has over. seen thus far. Over and over, shoulder bump. Should we really bump. have a hard time, hard time with the head positioning. Nice, Gary, good. Karen Melendez is just dominating the head positioning, which is making Shokui look in directions that makes her weak and opens her up to the knees. Good to punch combination from Shokui to create distance. A minute left here in the opening round. Good slip by Melendez. Able to see. One, two, oh, counter right, landed for Melendez. Shabui, bloody. 30 seconds left in the round, and again, a good job of Melendez using angles to escape the attack of a Shabui. And meanwhile, Melendez able to continue landing that bludgeoning jab. The jab is working. She's doing a beautiful job of countering. When Shogui comes in, she's looking for what she's throwing and countering well. And she's not, Shogui is not setting up, throwing everything with bad intentions, which of course is taxing the gas tank as well. Final seconds of uh, the opening round where Melendez outstruck Sengul Shogui, I should say, 1912. It's spelled S E N G U L, but the pronunciation is Shogui. Sit back, land our jabs, and counter on the way in, okay? Jabs are gonna come in, and if you wanna clinch, clinch her, misdirection, right to the fence. Hang out on the fence, but practice on recovering while you're on the fence. Work, breathe, recover. Doing a great job. You're beating her with that hook. You can see right here, that knee right there sets the tone. Oh, right into the rib cage. Beautifully done by Carrie Melendez, and then she just continued that attack, and it was smart. She was listening to her corner the whole time. Everything they called out, 
she was working and doing. Beautiful. Dirty boxing inside, big elbows. But she did seem to get a little bit tired. A lot of that she needed to step back, take a breath. Now she's had that ability. Let's see her come out in the second round, what she can do. A lot of damage to show we as far as facially. The nose looks like it might be broken. Low kick by Melendez to the lead leg of Shogui. Lead high kick. Shogui again, missing with the one, two. Good counter right hand upstairs by Melendez. He's landed big advantage for Melendez. When you got 100% there, it's pretty low. Again, the check for plans for Melendez. Felt that Melinda's biggest strengths were speed and her patience. That, you know, it's a great assessment because one of the things about Carrie Melinda is she is patient. She takes her time. She waits for you to make mistakes and she tries to take you back. Oh, right there. There's Shockwave's best punch of the fight that popped Melendez's head back momentarily. Now Shockwave against the fence. Melendez with the grip, the over under. And in those situations when she's using that cage and grabbing it, you're seeing Blake Rice talk to her, but she grabbed and held that position to pull Carrie into her. It's time to just say, no, you lose the position and put him back to the center. Finally, away from the cage, Melendez, front headlock. She has two submission wins on her record. Yeah, uh, she's starting to work that guillotine. Looking for her first high guillotine choke win. She's got two rear naked chokes, and there's a the tap! And Carrie Taylor Melendez improves to 6-0 and with her third submission win, first via guillotine, as she sends Sabri Shogui to her second consecutive defeat inside the Bellator MMA cage, and she falls to three and four overall. But a successful night for Carrie Taylor Melendez, and she celebrates now with her hubby, the MMA power couple, the Melendez family. And of course, their, their daughter, the reason she does this, Leila Kay, she wants to inspire mothers everywhere, John, and here's some inspiring stuff from Kerry Melendez. Doing some great stuff. Look, this is where she starts to set up the guillotine, and she changed the grip. She had it arm in, and she pulled her arm to the outside, got it deep, and once she wrapped that leg on top, it was all over. Nowhere for Shogui to go. Beautiful guillotine submission win by Kerry Taylor Melendez. Here's Michael C. Williams with the official announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, with the guillotine in tight, the tap comes officially two minutes, six seconds into round number two. The domain of I submission still undefeated carry. Take her. A perfect six and oh for Carrie Taylor Melendez as all six of her fights have taken place inside the Bellator MMA cage. As we turn the page, let's go back to the fight desk. Here's Amanda.
Moro, thank you. Big John, hello to you down there. Hope you're having a good time. Uh, Josh, let's talk about the first fight of the night. We have the continuation of the lightweight World Grand Prix. Winner of this gets to punch their ticket to the final. A chance to win a million dollars in that. Patricky Bipple going up against Alexander Shabley. You have a very interesting perspective because you fought Patricky. You've trained with Shabley. What do we need to know about both of them going up against one another? Both these guys are two of the best strikers in the game in the sport of MMA. Both of them are snipers when it comes to their boxing. But what I look at Shabley, right? He is more of a technician. He's someone that will make you, he will slip and make you pay if you make a mistake. Whereas Patricky will take a shot, deliver a shot, and he's hoping to land that big knockout punch. He's got power in both hands. And he, and he doesn't really need to set it up because he knows if he touches you, you're going to sleep. Shabley's a little bit different. He will be slick about everything he does. Very good defensive fighter, stays right outside the range. He is more of a Floyd Mayweather type boxer. He'll get in there, touch you, touch you, wait for you to make a mistake, and then put your lights out like he did against former champion Brett Primus. You mentioned the power of Patricky there. Alexander Shabley has never been knocked out before. Also, Patricky, uh, 37 years old now, said a lot of people have asked him about his age leading up to this fight. He said, if I can win a million dollars as an old man, Man, I think I'm doing pretty good. And you said on your podcast, he has not lost any of his power. No, he, he, power's the last thing to go in fighting. We all know that. That's heavyweights stick around for a long time because they still have that power. But it's funny how a million dollars can make you feel a lot younger. I, I, I would feel much younger. I'd be 25 again if I had a million dollars. Uh, Moro, we'll send it back down to you. All right, thank you very much. Well, a million dollars at stake in the lightweight World Grand Prix. The second semifinal matchup kicks off Bellator 301's main card. Nine Eastern, six Pacific on Showtime. Former champion Patricky Pitbull will take on the surging Alexander Shabley. And then we will see the return of A.J. McKee, a former featherweight champion who is continuing to do his thing at lightweight as he looks to go 3-0 at 155. He takes on the double tough, number five ranked Sydney Outlaw. And then Rafion Stotts, Danny Sabatello. They will renew hostilities here in Sabatello's hometown of Chicago with the Italian gangster looking to avenge a loss to Stotts and a double championship fight. Card will headline Bellator 301. Sergio Pettis defends the 135 strap against Grand Prix winner Patchy Mix. And Yaroslav Amasov looks to remain undefeated as he defends the welterweight title against Jason Jackson. All right, we continue with Bellator MMA prelim actions. Timur Hizriv, he turns 28 on Sunday. He takes on Justin Gonzalez as we are scheduled for three five-minute rounds in the Bellator Feather weight division. This is an incredible featherweight matchup. 13-0 for Kizriev, 14-2 for Justin Gonzalez. Both just outstanding young fighters. Cannot wait for this one to go off. Here's Michael C. Williams. For all those that have just joined us on the live stream, we welcome you to Chicago here at Wintrust Arena. The Bellator 301 prelims continue now as we go three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145.4 pounds. His professional record, 14 wins, just two losses in the rankings. He's in at number seven, Justin J. Trey. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 146 pounds even as a professional. He's undefeated, 13 wins, no defeats, ranked now at number six, Timur Imam Hizri. In charge of the action, referee Mike Simarusi. He's reeved 13 and 0 with four finishes. <laughs> Justin Gonzalez looking to rebound from just his second defeat. That one against Mads Burnell as we begin this matchup contested in the featherweight division. Already, he's reeved switching stances giving Gonzalez different looks. A battle of top 10 ranked 145ers. Nice right hook. Uh, he's reaped as Gonzalez closed the gap, John. A 
lot of people are going to think that he's Riv is going to be going after the takedown. He likes to be in the stand-up. He likes to throw his hands. He throws beautiful kicks. Justin Gonzalez is a guy that will be probably looking for the takedown more than his Riv. This oh, is a yeah. great matchup. He's Riv known to stand and bang and already showing evidence that's exactly what he wants to do here tonight as Gonzalez swinging wildly, missing, although Throwing with bad intentions as one minute has elapsed here in the opening round. Push kick to the midsection by Hezri, mixing up his attack. Beautiful defense by Justin Gonzalez there. Gonzalez's corner wanting him to keep him guessing. Switching stance is coming forward. Walks into the right hand from Hizreev. Hizreev immediately attacking on the ground inside control. It was just a beautiful job by Hizreev as far as in the stand-up. Cut the angle, 45 degrees. That's what made Justin Gonzalez miss. And then he lands the counter strike beautifully done. And Gonzalez able to maneuver now into those butterfly hooks. Controlling the right arm of Hizreev with that overhook from bottom, looking to shrimp his hips. 245 left in the first. Justin's in a nice position there with that elevator hook with his left leg. Hizreev's trying to pass that right leg. Hizreev trains with American top team and, of course, in his native Dagestan, Gonzalez with top-notch sports academy and trials MMA. A shout out to his trainer, Mike Alarez, who's had to overcome so much health issues, but it's incredible that he is with Gonzalez and is proving to be inspiring and motivating. Just over two minutes left in the first round, and his reef continues from top position, looking to pass guard, lands a right. Gonzalez, new hand fighting. This is an important moment for oh. Justin Gonzalez. In his last fight against Maz Brunel, Maz was able to control position on him on the ground a lot, and that made a difference in the fight. Beautiful left hand. Yeah, the left hand by Hizreev lands, and now he's got the, uh, well, very, uh, the, the calling card, as it were. If you're for those legs yep. up in the air, you're not going anywhere. Less than 90 seconds left in the first. Hees Reed continues to control from top position. Outlanding Gonzalez. Gonzalez posting. Gets back to his feet. Back control by Hees Reed. Gonzalez looking to break the grip. Looking to switch. Back elbow by Gonzalez. And a back attack. But back right up goes Gonzalez. Beautifully done. Hees Reed needs to try to work getting that returning it, but Justin Gonzalez needs to work with those hands right now. He's not working the hands, and if you don't work those oh. hands, that was real cool. Yeah, was very great. And scoops out the legs, and he's revenged Gonzalez on the uh, ground as 40 seconds now uh, remain in the first. Couple of right hands, series of rights from he's Reed, but Gonzalez trying to win the hand fighting battle at least as he tries to find a way off the fence, but just a relentless he's reef. And that's the whole system is to continue to chain these techniques together. You got the single leg here, beautifully done. He gets him to the ground. Justin trying to take the back, unable to do so based upon that underhook. Just beautiful work by both men. by Gonzalez at the bell. Deep breath. Deep breath, another one. All right, you felt it now, all right? We gotta let our hands go a little bit, all right? We gotta let our hands go. Quick, quick punches. Find your jab. 
Find your jab for me, okay? And it'll set everything up for you, all right? Find your jab. Breathe. Second round begins. Ryan Schultz in Gonzalez corner wants his fighter to find his jab. He's Reeve again. Good opening round, and he spent a lot of his camp sparring with uh, Nathan Schultz. Prior to that, back in his native Dagestan. And of course, a bunch of great fighters over there, and John the Strikes uh, landed. Well, that round showed you exactly what we thought his Reeve just outstruck, out grappled. He got the round, no doubt. Justin Gonzalez really needs to change things up. Oh! He took a big shot right there. That was a beautiful kick by his rib. And Gonzalez took it. Now looking to circle away and doesn't want to circle to the, the power alley of that rear kick by Timur Hizreev, who has had success in every facet. And Gonzalez, wild right hand, paying for it as Hizreev times the takedown. That was unbelievable that he was able to take that kick. I was looking right at it. It snapped his head back, and he was able to stay on his feet, smartly moved in a lateral fashion around the cage to give him time. But man, I don't know how he stayed up from that kick. You see Justin starting to reach with his hands there. That's not a good sign. You gotta keep yourself tight. Double jab by his backs. Gonzalez up, moves to his left to reset, eats the calf kick, level change by. He's Reeve. Gonzalez was looking for the guillotine attempt and now gets back to his feet. Body kick by Gonzalez. Counter right hand of the body by He's Reeve. Undefeated at 13 and 0. Gonzalez 14 and 2. Gonzalez came into Bellator undefeated, I believe, at 11 and 0. And his two losses, you take a look. Aaron Pico. Great fight between the two. Pico was just able to do better throughout it in the rounds. And then Mads Burnell. And I thought that Gonzalez would learn something from that Mads Burnell fight. But he's having a hard time in figuring out what his room is doing in the stand up here. And the naked shot by Gonzalez, a desperation shot, well defended by his Reeve, almost made him pay for it with the counter strike. Body kick. Gonzalez catches it momentarily, and he's Reeve able to extricate himself. Counter right hand by he's Reeve. He's Reeve very good at intercepting the attack exactly. of Gonzalez. And as you're looking at these exchanges, it's always his Reeve who's able to land with power. Justin's just trying to figure out a different line, a different way of attacking here. Just hasn't quite found it yet, but no, he's starting to lead, eat it to the body. Lead left hook to the liver there by Heesreeve, jumping the attack by Gonzalez, and again, countered by Heesreeve. And that, you know, this is what you're looking at. When you see a fighter doing this, and we talk about, look, you gotta counter, you gotta make them, they're gonna do something coming towards you, you gotta make them pay, or at least make them have something to deal with. That's what you're seeing out of his group. by Gonzalez, and that's what his corner wanted to see more of. He's been unable to utilize the textbook punch under a minute left here in the middle three. And oh, Isri catches him again with the combination. 
He's rebounding. Opening up a huge edge in terms of total strikes landed. He's also secured three takedowns in this fight, so it's all undefeated fighter Timur Hizriv hoping to give himself an early 28th birthday present. 30 seconds left in the round. Beautiful straight jab that landed for Gonzalez, but he needs to get more than just one. Back right hook by Hizriv. <laughs> Adjustments need to be made. And risks may indeed need to be taken as we head to the third and final round. Here is that kick right under the chin. His riff just blasted him with that right kick right under the chin. And I, man, I'll tell you what, that is unbelievable that Justin Gonzalez. Let's hear that real time, real sound. <laughs> that Justin Gonzalez was able Check to take that and stay on the feet. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together as we go now to the third and final. Timur Hizri's been training with high-level fighters since early in his career, including MMA legend John Jones for Justin Gonzalez. Needs to find a way to solve the puzzle of the undefeated Timur Hizriv. He's got less than five minutes to do so. One of the things when you're watching Hizriv call is look at the balance. Mm -hmm. He's always in balance. He's always ready to throw either with he's from southpaw or orthodox. He's ready to respond with a counter or an offensive attack. He's a cage general in this fight. Ooh, I like that. There's a nice kick from Gonzalez. And again, he's able to close the distance. Gonzalez utilizing the whizzer and then on the escape there for the break, looking to deliver the left hook, but just finding errors. There's a kick again from. Wow! Mamma <laughs> This team or history, we saw that crazy kick earlier in the fight, and then that backflip escape. That was a Kerry Kolak. Unbelievable. Backflip at the single leg right there. Kerry Kolak made that famous, man. I'll tell you what, he just pulled it off beautifully. And if Timur Hizri knows who that is, I'll be even more impressed. Oh, go, but good job, my man. Incredible stuff here from Timur Hizri. <laughs> Reminded me my other profession at one time. That was a straight out of a pro wrestling match. My goodness. And you can start to see a little bit of the frustration building. Justin Gonzalez has just been trying to figure out what he can do throughout this entire fight. Nothing's really working for him, and he's just starting to get a little frustrated with just the inability to be offensive and stop what Timur Hizriv can do. No stopping Hizriv tonight. He has been relentless, continues his attack with the back control. Gonzalez trying to break the grip, trying to switch position. Hizriv. Looking to find a way to take him back to the mat. Now decides to exit. There's the fight IQ of Hizri. Takedown's not there. I'm not going to waste any more energy. <laughs> Justin Gonzalez is kind of deciding I need to fight down and really just start to sling. Big shots at him. He knows he's behind. He's just trying to do anything he can to land the shot that's going to change this round. Oh, oh just well timed. Timing is another 
one of two or these three strengths and there's been a clinic here tonight. Here in Chicago, where he's successfully debuted for Bellator at Bellator 288 for the victory over Daniel Weichel, who retired this year inside the Bellator MMA cage. Joining legends Fedor Emelianenko, Benson Henderson, and former Bellator middleweight title challenger John Salter. Low kick by. Starting to eat up the leg of Justin Gonzalez. He had a hard time putting his seats put to the rear. He can't push off of it. That's just more trouble. I mean, we have to be so impressed with what Israel has done here throughout this fight. In all facets, John, absolutely. The patience, the technique, the timing. Not, and, and, and even when tasting the momentary moments, able to adjust on the fly. And, 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 it's not against the scrub, it's against the good. <laughs> Justin good Gonzalez, 14 and 2, who you mentioned. I mean, lost only to the upper tier, Matt Burnell and, and Aaron Pico. 30 seconds left in the fight. With a dominant performance here tonight. Time is wrong, guys. It's a fight. Hey, thank you, gentlemen. Good fight. What a performance. Well, what I mean, a performance. You talked about it, John. Three moments of things I've never seen. <laughs> and obviously, the sport continues to grow and evolve. But the fact that he was in control and so far ahead and still willing to do stuff like that that makes a fighter memorable absolutely let's take a look at some of the things that this man did throughout here's here is where he pulls the carry cool going over awesome. the top beautifully done i mean just unbelievable the presence that's fantastic to try to get himself out of that gonzalez was there i mean just a great job here he goes with the beautiful wow Hip toss, nicely done. Let's watch from a different angle on this. You're going to see him step through. And when he steps through with that right leg, up it yeah, comes. Ah, beautiful. Hard How do you say it in Japan? Hardagoshi. There you go. Beautifully Shindo done. Throw extraordinaire by Timur Hizrib. Again, turning 28 on Sunday. Happy birthday after an incredible performance here tonight. And again, credit to Justin Gonzalez. John, you've seen it all in MMA. You saw him he hit him with one of the nastiest front kicks you're going to see. My God. And Gonzalez stayed on his feet. Yeah, we've seen, we've oh. seen several fighters hit with kicks like that, and they've always gone out. And he didn't even go down. Crazy. It's time for the official decision with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges, Sal D'Amato, Brandon Mason, Brian Miner. All three at cage side have it exactly the same at 30 to 27 for the winner by unanimous decision, Timor and Fourteen and O. Oh. Happy twenty-eighth birthday on Sunday to the tremendously talented Timur Hizrib. John, final word. Wow. Ah, couldn't say it better myself. Bellator three hundred one rolls on. <laughs> hey, Bellator Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. 
See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. The new Bellator MMA app is here. New look, new features, new fights. Watch live weigh-ins and prelims. Share your fight picks. Earn points and badges as you rank up to the heavyweight division. And stay up to date on events, rankings, and news. For all the latest features, download the new Bellator MMA app. Available on the App Store and Google Play. Tonight. Let's go. Bellator Gold is up for grabs. Left, right, yeah, I hit him with that one, too. With two title fights. Famasov, the Ukrainian champion. Jason Jackson with the victory. Sergio Pettis, spectacular. Mex has stunned the MMA world. Plus a lightweight Grand Prix semifinal battle. You know I'm gonna get my all when I call show, y'all. Bellator MMA, tonight, live on Showtime. Welcome back to Bellator 301 here in beautiful Chicago, taking a look at the Chicago River there. Uh, we've had gorgeous weather since we've been here. Surprisingly, for the middle of November, late November, it's been like in the 60s. Today, it's getting a little chilly, though. However, at Bellator 301, things are heating up inside the Trust Arena. Taking a look at our main card coming up tonight, we have two world title fights between Yaroslav Amosov and Jason Jackson. And then in the Bantamweight division, Sergio Pettis putting it all on the line against Patchy Mix. But we're going to talk about the lightweights between AJ McKee and Sydney Outlaw, though. Josh, I mentioned it's cold, right? We're in Chicago. So I have this under here. Hold on. I'm going to put it on for this because it's freezing. And I think AJ McKee would like this. How do I look? I think I look really cool. St stunning. Stunning. Like, Absolutely stunning. Like, I'm so. Like, I could walk out with, like, all of his money. Um, okay, let's talk about A.J. McKee. Uh, showing up at the weigh-ins, looking very intimidating. We have seen such an evolution of A.J. McKee. We got to talk to him this week, 28 years old now. And the maturity level of what we have seen from him is remarkable. Haven't seen him fight in a year. What can we expect tonight? Well, coming off the Featherweight World Grand Prix, winning that against Patricio Pitbull in the finals with the knockout and the submission, like the, sorry, getting getting rocked and, get, and doing the, the, the submission, but his fight with Spike Carlisle was amazing, but it was his first fight at 155. He fought a little bit more careless, a little bit more reckless, and so the maturity, though, had to grow from there. And he was able to do everything he wanted in that fight, but it just didn't look like the real, the real AJ McKee that we had seen at the Featherweight division. He was just really explosive, but he ran himself kind of thin. But then when he fought the Souza over in Japan, he fought a very smart fight. Sprawl in brawl. He was very conservative. He let the fight develop in front of him. He kept himself in tune with everything that was going on. He was explosive at moments, but he never let himself get too far out of position to where he couldn't recover. He understood that D'Souza was somebody that could finish the fight in seconds, in a blink of an eye, if he made a mistake. The maturity that he is, we've seen from him in just those two fights. I'm really looking forward to seeing how much more he's matured in this year away and now tonight. Let's talk about Sydney Outlaw. Look, he, he's looking to make a statement proving that he can still fight with the best of the best and win those fights. He said, my last name's too cool for it not to be in the history books. How does he do it against a guy like AJ McKee? I mean, last name like Outlaw, I mean, that is pretty cool to be honest. So, but no, <laughs> I'm looking at Sydney Outlaw. Look, he just got to believe in himself, and I think he does. And I think um, he's got a lot. He's got a lot to prove, not just to others, but to himself, that he belongs in that top tier. Because he's come up short a couple times when he's gotten to the top. Now this is his moment to get a win over someone like AJ McKee, who everyone is considered to be probably one of the best lightweights in the world, in the top two or three in the world right now. And I'm looking. I look at Sidney Ello. He's got all the tools. To, to get this win over AJ, all he's got to do, and I know it's easier said than done, he's got to go ahead and set his striking up to get this fight to the ground. He's got to remember that he is one of the best scramblers in the game. When he fought Adam Piccolotti and he fought Mamadoff, as you're seeing right there, his scrambles for him to get on top is what he's got to do. He's got to make sure he never settles. He's got to be relentless with his attacks and his wrestling, and he's got to control that tempo of the fight against AJ McKee. It's going to be tough. It's going to be incredible. AJ said, though, uh, you can still expect the dollar bills. <laughs> when he won out. Look at that. All right, Maura, we're going to go back down to you. Yeah, cash rules everything around me. Get your money, dollar, dollar bill, y'all. So, okay, let's continue with one of the hottest prospects in all of MMA, Lady Samurai Sumiko Inaba, 
6-0 under the Bellator banner. She takes on former Bellator kickboxing champion Denise Kielholtz, 7-5 in MMA. We welcome our next fighter making her way to the cage. This is Miss Dynamite Denise Kielholtz. a world-class kickboxer who has combined her speed and power to devastating effect, but we have seen her develop into a fully formed mixed martial artist, continues to grow in the ground game, married to kickboxer, mixed martial arts, guy who's also a coach, big man in Hensley Gurgis, but she is really, at the age of 34, still coming into her own as a mixed martial artist, and tonight she tries to derail one, as we mentioned, one of the uh, most talked about prospects in MMA, Lady Samurai. Sumiko Inaba. You're absolutely right, but the thing about Denise Kielholz is, first off, she's always had the stand-up game. She is Miss Dynamite because she's explosive with her hands and kicks. She's never had to worry about that, and she has a toughness about her that a lot of people don't have. They can dish it out, but they can't take it, and Denise can absolutely stand in the fire and throw back. Her ground game has gotten better and better. She's done classes with people like Hoist Gracie. She has got a submission game and has submission wins on her record. She is absolutely coming into her own as a mixed martial arts fighter. Yeah, seven and four here in Bellator with two knockouts and three submissions. Return to the win column in May of this year at Bellator 296 with a unanimous decision win over Paula Christina. And now, her opponent to make her way, Samiko, Lady Samurai Inaba. Ready or not, here I 32-year-old, the Lady Samurai, Sumiko Inaba. Has grown before our very eyes here in the Bellator cage. All of her professional mixed martial arts fights have happened in this promotion. She's 6-0 six, six and oh, and drawn her three knockout victories in the Bellator women's flyweight division are the most in divisional history. She definitely loves to stand up most. Does she love it enough to take it to a former kickboxing champion into these kill holes? Look, she has proved that she has got clean stand-up. They have a common opponent with Vita Ortega. Nico just absolutely boxed her ears off. It was a beautiful performance. And so you know that she can stand with anybody based upon that one performance. Yeah, Kielholz was submitted by Ortega. That was back at Bellator 205 in September 2018. And Inaba's coming off that victory over Ortega. Bellator 295 this past April in her native Hawaii. Our tail of the tape for this flyweight matchup at 32 years of age compared to 34. Both of these women are in their prime and ready to shine here tonight. A man who always shines in the center of that cage. Let's go back to Michael C. Williams. For all those in the UK staying up with us late night, live on BBC iPlayer, we thank you for joining us here in Chicago. As here at the Bellator 301 prelims, we go to a feature fight. Three five-minute rounds in the flyweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot three, weighing in 124 pounds, even with multiple kickboxing world titles to her credit as a mixed martial artist. She's a former world title challenger and brings seven professional victories along with five defeats. Holding the number six ranking out of Amsterdam, Netherlands, presenting Denise, Miss Dynamite Keelholz. 
and across to cage her adversary. Fights out of the rip corner at five foot four, weighing in 125.2 pounds with all of her professional fights inside the Bellator cage tonight. She brings the number five ranking as she enters with six victories, no defeats, fighting out of Maui, Hawaii, presenting the undefeated Zemiko, Lady Senua Minava. And when the bell rings, your referee in charge, Rob Madrigal. Miko Inaba, Lady Samurai, Denise Kilholtz, Miss Dynamite. Denise, you ready? Miko, you ready? The fuse is lit. Round number one. Started the sport relatively late at 29, was in nursing school, but decided to take up fighting and really credits her fiance, Sean Rush, who was her coach with, with helping her. She's also a, a mother, wants to inspire mothers everywhere. And for Kiel Holtz, who again has such a decorated career as a kickboxer, now coming off a victory that ended a three fight losing streak, restoring her confidence. And, Another opportunity here for both these ladies to continue to grow in the flyweight division. And Inaba with a one, two. The thing when you watch both of these ladies, look at the technique on both of them. Yes. Watch how they throw. Watch them slide in and out. Everything that makes you go, dang. Fast and efficient. So well, exactly. And that makes them fun to watch. Beautiful low kick by Kielholz. She's starting to really target that lead leg of Anaba. Kielholz feels that the pressure of staying undefeated can cause you to make mistakes, and of course she'll try to ensure that Anaba does make those mistakes, although Anaba lands a sharp jab there. That was a clean jab right down the middle. And she, she just fires that jab off like a piston. She just brings it straight back on the same line, fires it back out again, just well done. Double jab by Inaba, closes the distance with the right and again pumps the jab. Past the midway point of the opening round. Low kick by Kuhos to the lead leg of Inaba. She responds with an inside low kick. Oh! oh and the of balance over that kick. She went up high and that leg just slid right by the head of Kuhos. Good job of Inaba, not just to deliver one jab, but to double up on the jab. And you don't see that a lot. And that's the one thing she, she does time and time again, and then she'll oh. throw that right hand straight right. down the pipe. Heel holds with a clean counter combination. Staying focused, staying composed. There's a left hook upstairs countering the low kick by Inaba. I think the big difference you're seeing here between the two, well, Anaba comes with a kick there. Kielholz is being a little bit more well-rounded. She's throwing her hands and the kicks a lot. Anaba tends to look like she's going more towards a boxing-centric. Beautiful right hand. Yeah, caught uh, Kielholz with the right cross. Final minute of the first five minutes. Again, the double jab from Inaba. Doesn't fall with the right, but lands right cross there. He's 
trying to switch her stance. Yep. A little bit of be devil and now we'll give him something to think about. Yep, exactly. It's well done. That jab is just beautiful though. She doubles it up. Nice hook. Final 30 seconds of the first round, and there's the level change and the takedown attempts brawled by Kiel Holtz, and Kiel Holtz able to defend it. Lanson punches upstairs well, as she retreats. As, as Denise says, yeah, let's go. Yep. Final 15 of the first. But giving Kiel Holtz something to think about as Inaba did change levels, went for that takedown. First round is in the books. So Inaba with a huge advantage in terms of total punches landed, while Kielholtz owns the advantage in terms of kicks landed. And, it, and you can see the difference where they're both going. Denise is landing a lot of leg kicks, kicks to the body, mixing it up very well. Af toe even die rechter achteraan gooien. Wat jij ook goed doet, je blijft goed op die benen trappen. Blijf doen. Heb ze last van, want ze wordt al langzaam. Lekker blijven doen. En gewoon rustig blijven. Lekker in je rust. Wel even af en toe even exploderen, maar gewoon gewoon een keertje. When you get off, I need you to keep your range, but I want you to put her on the back foot a little bit, okay? You know she's throwing that hook in the over. Yeah. The leg kick, let's try and check and fire back to pass, yeah? Beautiful job. Good job. Amigo, amigo. Round two, round two. Round at number two, the undefeated Lady Samurai Sumiko Inaba in the red gloves. Denise Kielholtz in the blue gloves. Double jab by Inaba, but Kielholtz Going downstairs with that inside low kick to Inaba's lead leg. And John, as we mentioned, the kick's advantage belongs to Kiel Holtz. No, and she has the, has the advantage there. with the total strikes, but in terms of punches, it's Inaba with the edge 21 14. And it's really, it's really going to be interesting which way the judges go in that first round based upon, look, all judges don't see the same fight because they're seeing it from different angles. And are they going to give more credit towards the punching and punching towards the head that Inaba's doing or the overall striking game of Denise? Goals. and 10 on 10 rising the lead leg of Inaba. Inaba mar marches forward with punches. She's doing a good job of eating up that leg. It's just a steady diet of kicks when Inaba comes into range. Cumulative damage. And again, John, just those quick, nope. short, low kicks. But that will affect the movement and the ability to cover distance that Inaba is so comfortable and with at the start, but maybe not once she's eaten that leg up. And the ability to generate power. Take away the base, you take away everything, and Kiel Holtz with a faint, fainting with that. Leave that old sharp jab from Kiel Holtz. One of the things you heard out of Anaba's corner is they wanted her to start to push Denise Kiel Holtz back, put her on her back foot. Really is trying. You can see how she's working at doing it. It's just not quite getting to the point that they want to be. Body kick from Inaba. Kielholtz staying out of range for the most part. Comfortable distance. She tests the waters with the lead right. Inaba, as it looked like Kielholz wanted to feed her a right uppercut. It just wasn't there for her, yeah. Nice left hook by Kielholz. Very nice. Clean, beautiful job of circling out off of it. And again, John, doing a good job of paying attention and making sure her focus remains the lead leg of Inaba. Punch combination for Kielholz. 
Two minutes left in the second. Naba trying to find a way to close the distance and land some damaging blows. Kielholtz doing a good job of keeping her at bay for the most part. With her, the threat of her counterattack. Absolutely. And you know that that kick to that left leg is starting to have an effect because it's making Inaba think about when she's going to take that step in, and she knows it's coming. And Inaba split the guard of Kulos with a textbook one-two good score. And again, lands the one-two, changes levels, gets the single leg, first takedown, but Kielholtz able to pop right back up, and there's a counter hunter pushing by Kielholtz and lands a one-two of her own beautiful sequence from Denise Gillholtz. That's that judo background that Denise had early in her, early in her life. She was a judoka. She used it there beautifully, and then once she got up, it was like, yep, let's see. Yeah, I, I can take you down, too. Yeah, started her judo training at the age of 13, a former member of the Dutch national judo team, and of course, no surprise, a judo black belt showcasing some of her wares here in round number two. Lands the left. Thirty seconds now remaining, and wow, switch front kick there by Gilholz, trying to well find her groove and beginning to flow more, beginning to find her, her rhythm. And you're starting to see the difference of who's landing the heavier blows and the effect that it's having in the fight right now. Body kick by Naba, but the jab from Gilholz and Gilholz is with the overhand right, but good round again and. Gilholtz with the best sequence of offense in that five minutes. I'm not gonna fucking fool with you. I need you to give me this round. I need everything from you in this, okay? Listen, when you're getting onto that single and you're going up to the body box, he's trying to throw you, okay? Let's shoot double, okay? You're doing fine, you're doing, if you run that single, control the bottom leg, okay? Beautiful job here by Anaba, throwing that straight right down the pipe off of the jab. But there you see Denise pairing that. She got touch, she landed the hook, but watch what happens off of the takedown. Great job by Anaba to get the takedown, but wasn't able to hold it, and then you saw Denise Kielholtz reverse it. So does Sumiko Inaba remain unbeaten? Denise Kielholtz, the veteran, looking to make it two in a row inside the Bellator cage. The third and final round underway, and Naba comes out aggressively. Uh, how do you have it on your unofficial scorecard after 10 minutes, John, and why? Unofficially, I've got Denise Gilholtz winning the fight right now. I think she's just had better control. She's landed some heavier shots. And overall, you can see that her shots are starting to have more of an effect in the fight. Not that Samika Naba is, she's fighting beautifully. And it's a tight contest, but I think Denise Gilholtz, based upon the kicks and the punches, has gotten a little bit of an advantage. There was a deep and check hook domination by Gilholtz doing a good job of counterattacking again, continues to land that check left hook. And for Inaba, she needs to make adjustments and try to find a way to create angles. She's taking the fight to Gilholtz, but Gilholtz is able to keep her at range and, and counter effectively. Yeah, exactly right. You're seeing when she gets into range, that Kielholtz is like, okay, that's enough. You see Kielholtz start to do something, kick straight down the middle, little things that are giving a knob of problems. Nice jab again from the knob, and the knob has been there, the double, but been there it's, the whole been, fight. it's been, there's a predictable pattern that has developed for Inaba. Yeah, and, and again, it's partly based upon when I'm watching a MMA fighter be boxing-centric, meaning that they're using their hands for most of their output, 
against someone that's also using kicks, it usually doesn't fare well for them unless they have a power advantage. And Q Holds has now taken over the advantage in terms of total punches landed, 38 to 35 kicks. It's all Q Holds, 30 to 5. So we have definitely seen the veteran Denise Q Holds come on in this fight. And but it, and you, you've got to be honest and look at the it. The experience, say, oh, and overall, okay, all, everything. More experienced in MMA and also 50 fights in kickboxing yeah. makes a huge difference. Amen. And again, every fight is a learning experience. And Bernaba testing the waters now, coming in, looking as good as she has had thus far in her career. And stepping up tonight against Denise Kilholtz and staying in the pocket and still throwing punches. But needs to try to diversify, vary her attack. She wants to get back into it. And there, is there a mouse over her left yeah. eye as well? There's a, there's a mouse underneath, underneath. Naba's eye. You know, she's starting to show the effects of some of the shots that have landed. And he's got a little bit of swelling on her face there too. You know, she's, she is taking some shots from Naba, especially that jab. Multiple times, it's landed well in the straight right after. Beautiful right, right hand. hand that lands for Gilholtz and the jab. Gilholtz continues to pick off Sumiko Inaba. And there's Inaba level change. Another takedown was unable to do anything with the first attempt and now has Gilholtz against the fence with a minute 40 seconds left in the fight. Ground and pound from Inaba. Gilholtz building a base, getting herself back to her feet, beautifully done. A lot of pressure by Anaba there. You see her trying to use her head as a third arm. Gilholtz very strong, just turns her. Just that, that was just pure power. Well done. Double jab from Anaba, but no follow up with the right hand. And One minute left in the fight. Stats favor Denise Kielholz. Kielholz really trying to load up on that counter right hand right there. Just landed it. And yeah, really marking up the left eye of Sumiko Inaba, level change, just runs out of real estate. So Sumiko Inaba coming in at 6-0, taking on the 7-5. Denise Kilholz, but as John mentioned, so much more experience in kickboxing and overall combat sports experience and definite learning experience for Sumiko Inaba here tonight as they go the distance. Both displaying their heart, both feeling they've done enough to win. The two warriors embrace, exchange pleasantries, knowing they forged so much respect after battling for 15 minutes. The undefeated Sumiko Inaba, Denise Kielholtz, going three rounds in the flyweight division. And according to our fight stats, you should expect to hear the name of Denise Kielholtz announced as the victor as she outlanded Sumiko Inaba, 83-49 in total strikes, and according to the Unified Rules of MMA scoring criteria, first effective striking.
Here once again is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, after three non-stop rounds of action, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side, where all three, Sal D'Amato, Brandon Mason, Brian Miner, all have it exactly the same at 30 to 27, all scoring it for the winner by unanimous decision, Denise Smith Dynamite Kielholz. Clean sweep on the judges' scorecards for Denise Kielholz, who knocks Sumiko Inaba from the ranks of the unbeaten. Hesdi Gerges, there is Kielholz's husband as she celebrates a huge win here tonight and she will talk with our own big john mccarthy i'm here with i'm here with your winner denise keelholz you two went after each other you were a world champion in kickboxing but in mma you haven't had a slugfest like that in a while how are you feeling with a victory against someone that came after you so hard and just fought her butt off really great chicago much love for everyone who's here Denise, you have had so many fights where you have proved that your judo is good, your submission game is good, and we've always known that your stand-up is outstanding. When you were facing her and she was coming at you with everything she had, were you thinking at a certain point, man, what's gonna make this girl stop? <laughs> yeah, she's tough. I say to her, you're really a power mama. And um, you know, you have to have two fighters that can make a fight, and she really came to fight. So. Thank you, Simona, for this incredible fight. It was uh, my pleasure. Well, it definitely took two of you to do it. Congratulations on a beautiful win. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for an outstanding performance by Miss Dynamite, Denise Kielholz. Huge win for Denise Kielholz in the flyweight division. And speaking of the flyweights, We've got inaugural flyweight champion, Elise Malay McFarlane on the left of the screen. And right next to her, the current flyweight champion, Liz Carmouche, longtime training partners who recently went at it inside the Bellator MMA cage. Nice to see the friendship survive that matchup as two of the great ambassadors for MMA in attendance here tonight. Head to bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. Tonight. Let's go. Bellator Gold is up for grabs. Yeah, fight, yeah, I hit him with that one, too. With two title fights. Bamasov, the Ukrainian champion. Jason Jackson with the victory. Sergio Pettis, spectacular. Vex has stunned the MMA world. Plus a lightweight Grand Prix semifinal battle. Bellator MMA, tonight, live on Showtime. Back here at Bellator 301. We are oh so close to our main part coming up tonight, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Showtime. An incredible card for you coming up tonight. Two title fights there. You see them at the very top co-main events, if you will. But let's talk about our third fight of the night. Rafion Stotts and Danny Sabatello, a rematch between two guys who legit hate each other. And they will tell you that. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a little fake animosity. These guys do not like each other at all, Josh. Yeah, sometimes it's a shtick, right? They, they yeah. play a game, they play this little thing. But no, no, these two don't like each other. The trash talking hasn't gone overboard, but it definitely has gotten confrontational. But it's been fun to watch. Sitting from the outside, like a fly on the wall, it's been amazing to watch. Like I said, they hate each other, but we love both of these guys. All right, so here's the background between these two guys. Uh, they met once before, leading up to that, a ton of between these two 
It was a split decision. Rafion Stotts got the win. Danny Sabatello thought he should have had the win. Josh, walk us through what happened in this first one and maybe how we could see a different outcome tonight. The story of the fight was that Danny Sabatello's wrestling was a lot better than Rafion Stotts gave him credit for. And he found out right off the bat being taken down four times and Danny Sabatello able to control a lot of the tempo of the fight. But what the story was after that was the damage. Danny Sabatello wasn't able to commit a lot of damage or cause a lot of damage in that fight. And ultimately, that's what ended up giving Rafael Stas the fight. There was blood involved, there was elbows involved towards the end that led to the cuts that gave the judges his decision. Look, when you have four takedowns, you control 10 minutes of that fight on the ground and you land no elbows, that should tell you right there what the problem was. You've got to be trading damage to win these fights. That's what the judge is looking for, and that's what he needs to remedy in this fight. And, and I will say from talking to both of these fighters, Danny, the very first thing he said coming off that first fight, he said, I need more volume. He's also very cognizant and aware of what the judges are looking for. Is that something that plays through your head? I mean, now it is because he understands what he did wrong in the first fight. That being said, though, look, I expect the continuation of the first fight. There will be no filling out process. In the first fight, you have that first round of feeling out of, okay, is he fast? Is he hit hard? Is his wrestling this good? That's gone. So I'm looking for them to pick up on round six. So five rounds first fight, round six this one. And if it goes all three, it's going to be just nothing but two ferrets getting after it in terms of the wrestling. You love to say I that, absolutely. Uh, yeah, of note, this is just three. So they're going to have to get in there, go after it. You don't have five rounds. Uh, that last one, of course, went the distance. Morrow, let's send it back down to you for our final prelim of the night. All right, thank you so much, Amanda. And we feature action between Archie King Colgan. He is a perfect 8-0 to begin his career. He takes on fellow lightweight Peter Baust, who is seeking his first Bellator win in his second appearance in the Bellator MMA cage. And now set to make his way to the cage, Peter, the Archangel Baust. Thirty-five-year-old Peter Belst out of Breda, Netherlands, has had 100 kickboxing fights. Made his Bellator debut at Bellator 297 in June, losing to Gachi Rabadanov, and that means he is now looking to end a three-fight losing streak. And uh, boy, he is hit tough against. You know, we we just saw another highly touted prospect. Sumiko Inaba get knocked off uh, by Denise Kilholtz. Archie King Colgan is another guy on the rise. And Peter Baust, well, he has a tough task ahead of him. Look, at Peter Baust is fantastic with his stand-up. He has got beautiful kicks, punches. He's rangy. He's got power. But, man, he's up against a guy that is right now riding high. And not to disrespect, like John, you say, uh, Baust has, this is his 25th professional fight compared to only the ninth for Colgan, and right. yet. And yet, you're taking a look at Archie Colgan, and everyone is, and saying, the guy's good everywhere. He's got big power to stand up. His wrestling is fantastic. He's got a huge gas tank. What's what's the key to victory then for Mr. Baust? Look, at, I, you know, the one thing I'll say about Archie Colgan is he likes the stand up. And so, good. Let's get into that and let's see who's better there. Don't let him get into that wrestling game and make him, if he's going to wrestle, make him a wrestler that's diving in for the takedowns. And now set to make his way to the cage, Archie King Kogan. The 28-year-old Archie Colgan coming off the biggest win of his career over two-time Bellator featherweight title challenger Emmanuel Sanchez. And he's done his homework. He knows Bow's background as a Dutch-style kickboxer, but he feels that his footwork, his movement, his inside boxing, and, of course, his wrestling is what's going to help him get the job done. He says it'll happen inside of two rounds. Well, you know, making those predictions is great, but yeah. he, he, it's putting big, pressure on The big that. thing to do is go in there and just let the fight come to you. Be yourself. That's what Archie Colgan should do. And, and I'm telling you right now, 
you are looking at one of the future champions in the sport of MMA when you're watching Archie Colgan. He has all the tools necessary to get to the top. Action in the lightweight division, and where, of course, the second semifinal of the lightweight World Grand Prix will launch the main card of Bellator 301 at the top of the hour on Showtime. Former champ, Patricky Pitbull against Alexander Shopley. Archie King Colgan, well, he remains a prospect on the rise as we go to the tail of the tape for this, the final prelim contest of Bellator 301. As we talked, I say Archie Colgan loves to stand up, and he does, but 69.5 wow. to 75.5. He is at a disadvantage when it comes to the length. We'll see if it does make a difference. Here is Michael C. Williams. Tonight, from here in Chicago, Illinois, the time has come to conclude the Bellator 301 prelims, and we'll do it now with three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first, out of the blue corner, at six foot two, weighing in 155.6 pounds. His professional record, 17 wins, seven losses from Great Netherlands, presenting Peter, the Archangel Mouse. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 155.4 pounds. Now five and zero oh, with four knockouts inside the Bellator cage. Overall, as a professional, he's perfect with eight total victories, no defeats. Fighting out of Denver, Colorado, introducing the undefeated Archie K. In charge of the action, Jason Herzog. Half of Archie Colgan's eight victories have come in the opening round. While Boust told us that he's an all-around fighter who excels in the tactical well, part right? of the game. His fight right? IQ will be put to the test by the rising Archie Colgan. They touch gloves and away we go. A huge size advantage for Peter Boust. In terms of length, in terms of the <laughs> combat the musculature. The height, yeah, Colgan. exactly. But look at Peter Boy is really good in the stand up. He has good kicks. He's got good hands. Archie Colgan needs to be careful. It's always weird fighting a guy that much taller than you. It's a little bit strange until you get that idea of distance and range down. One of Colgan's greatest strengths as a young fighter is his composure while still executing an effective game plan. He believes that he is best at putting pressure on his opponents and staying aggressive. And he feels, and he's already shown, he gets more dangerous each and every time he is inside the Bellator MMA cage, but facing another different kind of puzzle in Peter Bouts tonight. You're absolutely right, and it's one of the things that we've seen out of Archie Colgan, though, is he's had opponents that you look and you go, oh, that's going to be a tough one. And he just takes his time in picking them apart, breaking them down. And this is what's so good about Archie Colgan, fight IQ, Get this fight to the ground and use what skills you have there. It's a big advantage. Former University of Wyoming wrestling standout, a two-time NCAA qualifier, four-year starter, and he felt that being on the wrestling team of the University of Wyoming helped him level up his game by improving his mentality and his strength, and he secures the first takedown in this fight and goes to work from top position. Colgan in half guard right here, but it's not a tight half guard. You can see he's trying to lock down on that leg as far as Peter Boyce is trying to, but he's just holding right here. There's no true danger right now to Archie Colgan as far as there's no sweep attempts. There's nothing that we're seeing from Boyce on the bottom that should give Archie any kind of problem in staying where he's at. Positioning the battle there, putting the pressure on top on 
Faust, whose seven losses include four submissions, so not that comfortable on the ground, as you mentioned, John, again, with that Dutch-style kickboxing background, but, of course, in mixed martial arts and training all facets, even though his experience largely in the stand-up department. Yeah, absolutely. And Faust is a guy, when you're looking at him on the feet, he's dangerous. That's why, if yeah. you're Archie Colgan, you're saying, why am I going to leave him where he's dangerous? Let me put him in a place where I am not going to get hurt and I can do damage. We saw impressive composure on the ground for Colgan in his last fight against the veteran title challenger, Sanchez. Yeah, I mean, you talk about, you know, a fight. You know, to, it's going to say exactly where you're at. Well, Manuel Sanchez wow. is as tough an individual as you'll find. No one gets rid of Emmanuel Sanchez. He is just a gamer. Great stand-up, great ground game. And Archie Colgan got the win against him, which says a lot about who he is. Cross face by Colgan as he is in the open half guard of Faust. Just over a minute left in the opening round. Already two minutes and 40 seconds of ground control and counting. So more than half the round has been spent on the ground with Colgan in control with 60 seconds now left in the first round. In terms of their strikes landed, they're even at seven apiece. Now Colgan going ahead with those short strikes. Guard, the, guard, the guard is just wide open. <laughs> Archie Colgan should just slice right through, getting to mount, and then start to posture up, put pressure on him, make him turn his back, make him make the mistakes that's going to lead to you getting your finish. <laughs> Referee wanting more action once. Colgan trying to improve his position. Seconds elapsing as we close out the opening round here in the final prelim fight of Bellator 301. Workmanlike effort in that opening round, John. Yeah, it was. It was, you know, just Archie Colgan being a better wrestler and being better at positioning on the ground. Obviously, he's going to get the round, but. Every time this starts, it starts in the stand-up. And boy, when you're looking at Bow, skip, spin he him, is in a level position change, juke step. We need to close the gap and put some heat on him now, okay? Fuck. Peter? Hey, you feel his guard, right? It's nothing dangerous. You can posture up and bring some more. You can do a lot more than that, right? Let's let's really let's score. When we're on top, let's dominate. Let's put, put him away, right? You don't need to let him in this thing. Let's get that takedown. You have to work hard work on the half guard and the close guard. Yes. And from there, you have water. Let's do this. Good work. Let's go. Positions, these fights, you want to show everything that you can do. Now, it doesn't have to be in a, in a moment's time, but with all that time on the ground, Archie Colgan stayed in one position basically and did some damage, but not enough for what he should have done in that round. there by Archie Golden. That's what he needs to do. Don't worry about just going after the head. Go to the body. Go to where you're comfortable going, but you need to be careful. Yeah, and he blocked that head, kid. Exactly. All those tools that Faust is so good with. Faust bouncing side to side. Trying to disrupt the focus of Colgan and let this not allow Colgan to set. Establish a tempo and rhythm. There's 
the kick from Bowser. Another kick by the Dutch kickboxer turned mixed martial arts. Right now, you're seeing Archie Colgan follow. Yes, I was going to ask. Uh, yeah, you don't want to follow. You want to cut it off or force him into your power. And there, Colgan now secures the takedown, dumping Bowsk on his back. He's two for two in the takedown department. At three minutes and 55 seconds of ground control in the first round, John, and here with three minutes left, he continues to control Boust in this position. And, and right here, you saw him already starting to try to do more damage right away, which is what you want to see, because look, the more damage you can put on him, the less fighter comes out if you ends up going to another round, and you want to make it to where He's beat down. He can't, doesn't have the same abilities. Wrapped his left arm around the, the neck of Baust and short right hand. Baust trying to get up, trying to create some kind of separation, and now just trying to neutralize the posture of Colgan. Colgan posturing up, short elbow strike to the face. Colgan's got his knee on that arm, so it's controlling the yep. right arm of Baust. And now he's able to feed some short right hands. Not a lot of pop on those, but again, continue to score points. Under two minutes left here in the second. Knee slice is the command from Colgan's corner. And that's, look, if you're Justin Salas in his corner, you're saying, man, I want you to move because it's gonna make Baus move. That's gonna open things up and it's gonna give you your opportunity to do damage, finish the fight, to just stay in half guard. Yeah, you can beat him, beat him down some, but you're not finishing the fight. And I want you to go for the finish. Nice, you see, right there. Slice right through just like you told him, Moral. <laughs> just like his coach told him. I'm, I'm just a messenger. And look at what happens. And yeah, he's got his back. Doesn't put his he got hooks the hook in. in there. Yep. And now Baust able to get to the fence. And there's a right uppercut. With power. And another right hand, another right. We've seen, as we've talked about in the past, Dan Henderson with success against Fedor Emelianenko in a similar position. And of course, anything can happen. And under a minute now left in the second. And Colgan getting a little more aggressive, starting to feed a, a few more punches to Baustu now neutralizes his hand. So he goes to the knee. <laughs> Just over 30 seconds now left in the second. And six and a half minutes of ground control total and counting for Archie Colgan in this fight. Opening up a big advantage here over Peter Baust with 15 seconds left in the second round. Knee strikes. Baust unable to get back to his feet. And Colgan again controls the round thanks to his wrestling. There's just a lot of it. He's got it obviously being very controlled. Right? Don't come down the middle because he's gonna now he's gonna be looking for his big knees and stuff. Let's spin him, maybe some juke step kind of stuff, and we gotta come forward. I need you to come forward. Get this motherfucker, dude. If you, if you can get into your range, you're gonna knock him out, okay? This fight is yours. Intelligently I mean, get into your range. Go ahead, Pete. Zelf, you can't him have a Pete. Geloof me. It's my één keer op te zetten. Eén keer. You're watching action between Archie Colgan and Peter Bauston to kick off the main card of Bellator 301, top of the hour on Showtime. Former lightweight champion Patricky Pitbull meets Alexander Shabli's won eight in a row in the second semifinal matchup of the lightweight World Grand Prix. It begins a massive Bellator 301 main card, top of the hour on Showtime. Is it? Fight around, fight around. 
showtime here in the third and final round for Archie Colgan and Peter Baust. Colgan's corner wants him to be more aggressive, wants him to take the fight to Peter Baust and go for that finish. Although Baust again unable to do much from his back, has been unable to defend the takedown, but has had some moments in the stand up, but it's, it's all Archie. Colgan and their ground control to yeah, you can make it top. <laughs> Look at that ground control. Three zeros on one side, that's not good. But Bowsby is in that position where he's worried about getting taken down again, so that's even negating some of his offense. He's worried about throwing the kick like he was before up towards the head, so he's just got to open up and go for it. Faustus thrown just 28 strikes total. Hogan 69. That's through two rounds in the time here in this third round as Colgan looking for the takedown. He's not only looking for it, he's, he's got, got it, it. but his hands wrapped. Faust was looking towards bringing a knee up. He just was a second behind in doing it. Colgan's corner wants him to dirty box. Get, score some points in this thing as he continues to expend the energy trying to utilize that. Griffin now throwing some right hands, but Faust jousting with it with the hands. And there's that knee up the middle by Colgan from the double collar tie in the right hand lands. Colgan's now said, dang. I'm gonna bring my knee up a lot, long, long ways to make it land. right here if Archie Cole kind of sit back with his hips a little bit there you go Pull down start jackhammering with that right hand Seconds left in the fight. That was flashing the jab, was thinking about delivering the kick. Colgan with the right hand down the middle. Another right hand to the sternum by Colgan. So those shots. here in Chicago with us 60 seconds left. Archie Colgan promised to close the show within two rounds. Has used his wrestling to secure plenty of ground time, but not a lot of offense on either side in terms of strikes thrown or landed, John. Well, you know, just not enough output to get that done. He's been very smart as far as his defense. He's kept his hands up high. Even when Faust tries to come up with a kick, he's there to block. But he's going to have to go back and look at this and say, you know what, there's some things I need to do different just to be a little bit more offensive at times. Than he was able. Oh, Faust looking for the knee and the nice counter right hand that popped Faust's head back. So 
this matchup goes the distance. John, I, you look at the stats and you look at what transpired in the, the third round. I, I have a feeling I know who you have winning the fight on your scorecard, and rightfully so, but I, I appreciate what you said, and I think he will as well in his corner, too, about what he can take away if indeed he does have his hand raised, as we expect for Archie Colgan. Another, again, experience. This is ninth professional fight. Yeah. Look at this. Every fight, you're learning something. You're doing more. You learn it. Certain things That's to do, certain things not to do. While we await the official decision, final reminder of what's coming your way at the top of the hour. Bellator 301 main card is a massive stack from top to bottom, including two title fights. Yaroslav Amosov, unbeaten at 27 and 0, makes the second title defense against Jason Jackson. Jackson hoping to do what his training partner, Logan Storley, failed to do, and that's unseat Amosov. Sergio Pettis squares off with Patchy Mix in a battle for the undisputed Bellator Bantamweight World Championship. Rafion Stotts, Danny Sabatello, the sequel. Stotts earned the victory via split decision the first time these two bitter rivals battled. AJ McKee returns to competition, looking to go 3 0 at lightweight against the number five ranked 155er, Sydney Outlaw. And again, we will begin with semi final action in the lightweight World Grand Prix. The former champion, Patricky Pitbull pitted against the number two ranked Alexander Shabli who's won eight straight, including four in a row inside the Bellator MMA cage. Don't miss the main card of Bellator 301 coming up in 15 minutes on Showtime. For now, let's go back to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's final prelim here at Bellator 301 will go once again to your judges' scorecards for all three judges, Brian Puccello, Scott Jones, Eric Colon. See it the same, 30-27, all having it for the winner by unanimous decision, Archie K. Colgan. Archie King Colgan improves to nine and oh, the number 10 go, baby. ranked lightweight. Know. Another dominant finish. Never lost a round so far. I could have done more, but you know, we're happy with the win. Test, my baby boys. I'll see you soon. The winner gets the final word. We'll see you at the top of the hour on Showtime for Bellator 301 from Chicago. Tonight. Let's go. Bellator Gold is up for grabs. Left, right, yeah, I hit him with that one, two. With two title fights. Bamasov, the Ukrainian champion. Jason Jackson with the victory. Sergio Pettis, spectacular. Mix has stunned the MMA world. Plus a lightweight Grand Prix semifinal battle. You know I'm gonna give my all when I come show y'all. Bellator MMA, tonight, live on Showtime. Right now, 
Chandler, Chandler is all over him. Chandler trying to move to side control and he has it. Chandler knee on belly passes. Beautiful pass now into mount for Michael Chandler. And he has great recovery, but he's mounted right now. Now giving up his back. Chandler looks That's the it. Man, it's a There's the top, and we have a new champion. That right hand was landing all night, but this time he was able to get on top, able to get in his comfort zone on a rocked and hurt Eddie Alvarez and never let him off the hook here in full mount. Eddie turned his back and from here, that's it, arm underneath. Power, Mataleon, rear naked choke. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage by way of a rear naked choke. The tap comes officially. Three minutes, six seconds into round number four. The winner by submission. And now the new Bellator lightweight world champion, Michael Chandler. Ready, sir? Ready? Let's go fight, guys. Round number one. Our fight clock is brought to you by Miller Lite, the official beer of Bellator. It's not just a good time, it's Miller time. Quick takedown from Ward. Nice timing on that takedown. Gave up the armbar, that's it! And there's the tap, just like that for Aaron Johnson! Man, Man that was simple. Man, beautiful job, great torque. Brendan Ward just shell-shocked, did not know what hit him. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the end comes 15 seconds into round number one. The tap brought on by the armbar winner by submission, Aaron Tex Johnson. Let's go fight. Round number one. Tonight's fight clock, big knee. We'll get to the fight clock in a moment. It's about to be unnecessary, I think. Going hard for the guillotine. McKay looking for the guillotine finish. He's in the gray trunks. Peterson in the camouflage trunks. I think he's out. I think he's out. out. Technical out. submission win for Dave McKay. Clock has been Red unnecessary Red tonight. He was out. He was unconscious. He's just Is here. That body kick started it. Remember that part. Yeah. Nice knee off balance. Thanks, but just the aggression Thanks, of Big K. Yeah, saw the guillotine and went for it yeah. with everything he had. It was an all or nothing commitment in this fight. He was going for the finish. If it didn't happen, he didn't care. He was going to go hard for the finish, and he got it only 18 seconds. Joy for Dave Vicke. That's an outstanding celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, no tap inside the cage. Therefore, the technical submission comes by way of a guillotine choke. The official time, 18 seconds into round number one, the A-Town Ogre, David K. Gary needs to be very careful in this position. This fight hitting the ground at this time with two minutes left in this round is not a good position for Darren Cruikshank to be in. You hear the corner talking about risk control. Kirk String trying to use that defensively three minutes into round number one. Yeah, it's getting bad right now. This is where Goichi is outstanding. The rear naked choke is his key. And it's all over! Goichi Yamauchi by rear naked choke! Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. The tap by way of a rear naked choke officially. Three minutes, 11 seconds. Round number one by submission. The winner, Goichi Yamauchi. Great way to start in front of friends and family here in Japan for Goichi Yamauchi. I'm here with your winner, Goichi Yamauchi. That was a beautiful display of being calm in a grappling situation. You pushed off the fence, you got him to the ground. Talk to me about that last rear naked choke attempt. Konnichiwa, um, Nihon. You know, this is my game. I, I think I'm the best in the world when we talk about uh, grappling game inside MMA. So. Uh, I did a job, I did everything that I've been exercising uh, inside my practice. So uh, this is a result of uh, hard work and dedication. And you know, Neiman's going to find that out in all these positions that he's getting in. 
John believes that if he understands who he's against and what's going on, you're not going to be able to just take this back and submit it. Another takedown. Beautiful takedown. But what John needs to do is he needs to tripod up and push his hands to the mat. What Ed Ruth made the mistake last night of doing is letting his balance get taken forward. They're talking to each other with smiles on the face. It is all over. Just like that. The smile goes away and the finish goes to Gracie. Take a look at what's going on here. This is where he had his leg trapped. You see John's left leg under there. Look at where he's got the heel. He is knee barring and pulling on that with a twist. It's almost a, a connection of that heel hook, inverted heel hook, but the straight knee bar position. He's pulling and twisting that down. That is an inverted heel hook with the hips engaging that knee. That is a painful submission. Beautiful job by Neiman Grace. Yeah, so what you're going to see here is we're going to see John Fitch tilt himself forward so he could put the bottom of his foot flat to the canvas so that Neiman couldn't get underneath the heel to get to there. Ladies and gentlemen inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes officially four minutes, 47 seconds, round number two by way of a heel hook. He is the winner by submission, Neiman Gracie. Like Josh made the point, about the fight we saw before. If you hold on to one attempt too long, you can burn yourself out. You In this case, Patsy No Love Mix is not doing it. Now he's going after look what he's doing here. This is a silver as stretch if he gets it. That is a painful maneuver. And it is all over! Patsy No Love Mix is 12-0. Right here, when he goes, and you see him drop it back. I knew he was thinking of that. Soon he'll have stretch. He grabs that ankle, and now he straightens the leg. And when he does, the pressure on the hamstring is incredible. You see that leg get stretched all the way across the body. Watch the torque and the pressure on the hamstring here. Look at where his leg is at. It's now straight on the outside. That's a terrible position to be in. Amar Suluev made that his technique. It has now come into play multiple times in MMA fights, but a first for Patsy Betts. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes by way of a knee bar. Officially, three minutes, 49 